Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, the first Indiana virtual conference, uh, Thursday, April 23rd. We've got a lot of great content to bring to you today. Uh, before we get started with our content, though, we do want to uh, very quickly uh, remind everyone that next week, uh, this time next week on Thursday, save the date uh, from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Eastern time, uh, we will be having our uh, virtual showcase. I will be handing out uh, some fantastic awards uh, for our first robotics competition and also going over our first tech challenge uh, award winners, first Lego League Junior, first Lego League. It's going to be a fantastic evening. Uh, it'll be right here, twitch.tv slash first in robotics. Uh, so please make sure to tune in next week, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. And with that now, uh, come on back. I'd like to uh, introduce Lucy and Angeli, who is uh, going to cover our first uh, topic this morning, uh, this afternoon, not this morning, uh, this afternoon, grant writing. Then uh, after our grant writing session, uh, we're going to have a cross-program mentoring uh, First Lego League Junior conversation. Uh, then uh, later we'll have question and answer team traditions. Uh, Sam from our first senior, uh, first student board of directors will be leading that conversation. So it'll be fun to see some of the fun, tacky and terrific team traditions. Uh, and then finally this evening from six to seven, STEM through a rainbow lens. It'll be a panel discussion uh, on the topic of improving the experience for LGBTQ plus students. So that's it for today. Uh, I'm going to pass it on to Lucy and our guests, Betsy, and uh, and go from there. So take it away. Thanks, Chris. Um, hi, Betsy. Thank you for joining us so much. Do you want to just start off and introduce yourself just a tiny bit? Hi, um, I'm Betsy Baxter. I've been a FIRST mentor since 2006, primarily um, doing business. And then professionally, I'm an event planner for Purdue University. All right, so let's get this started with the first question. What are some good ways to find grants and how often should you be submitting them? Um, so the best place to find grants is going to be uh, your local community. So you can look at community foundations or your local chamber of commerce or some local organization of things like Optimist Club. Uh, those community based grants are going to be easier for you to obtain and define. Uh, you can also look at the FIN newsletters that come out. They often have grant opportunities like from InMAX. And then as far as submitting grants, um, all of those different organizations are going to have different grant cycles. So you might have organizations like InMAX that have annual grants, and then there could be some like community foundations that do quarters or do once a fiscal year. Um, what are some key points to include when you would be writing a grant? Uh, so when you're looking at writing a grant, um, you need to make sure you're covering all of the questions that the grant asks. And you need to kind of start with the most broad topic possible and move gradually in. So for example, you might be thinking, oh, I want money for my team. That's a big, broad example. But it doesn't quite answer probably what a grant is looking for. And so you got to think about, well, why do you want that money? What do you want with that money? And it might come down to, well, we want more tools. You can ask yourself, what kind of tools do you want? And basically, um, your goal is to get to completely answer the question with things that you can put a dollar value amount on. So, you know, that could be the specific price for tools or a piece of shop equipment or if you're looking at money for your team for things like travel, it could be how much hotels will cost for a coming season or how much a bus would cost. So going off of that, is there anything that's too specific or too general to include in a grant? Um, so definitely when writing a grant, you try to, you want to be as specific as possible. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, I need to be very general, so that if I get the money, I can use it on a wide variety of things. And oftentimes organizations won't fund grants where they don't know exactly what the money's being spent on. So the more specific you can be, the more likely you're going to be to get what you're asking for. And I mean, you want to be as specific as possible. There's no such thing as too specific. Um, if you can produce a cart 
from a website like Amazon or an invoice from a bus company where you got a quote, you're going to be on the right track. Now, there is some wiggle room, for example, if you're writing for hotels for an event in the future and you don't 100% know how many students are going to be on your team, you can estimate in that case and say hotels at this particular or rooms at this particular hotel cost about this much money and we estimate we will have this many students on our team, therefore we're asking for this amount of money. And that's fine too. Um, so moving past that a little bit, would you recommend going for bigger grants or smaller grants? Um, it really depends on what you're looking for. Um, different organizations offer different size grants. So don't think, oh, we need lots of money. We should only be applying for big grants, but kind of break it down to what you want because sometimes a smaller grant might fit. And a lot of times uh, organizations are able to offer lots of small grants but only a few large ones. So using um, the Community Center for or Community Foundation, for example, um, they do different size grants at different times of the year. So they might do $500 grants four times a year, but only do $1,000 plus grants once a year. So what you can do is say, okay, how can we break up what we're looking for into these smaller manageable amounts so we can ask for these specific things in grants? Do you have any advice for the structure of when you're writing the grants? So if you have a grant and you're going for like one specific company, is there something you should include, something you shouldn't include, stuff like that? Um, a lot of times, uh, try to gather as much information as possible on um, what the grant, what the grantor is looking for, the person who has the grant. Um, a lot of different organizations have different goals in mind. So you want to try to structure what you're asking for to fit those goals. So for example, you might have an instance where you're applying for a grant for, let's say, tools for your team. There are sometimes going to be organizations that feel as though providing tools for a team is a school's responsibility. So they're going to ask themselves, well, why isn't the school paying for this thing for these teams? And so those grants don't always get funded. But what you might know is, you know, community foundations, for example, are interested in strengthening their community. So you might be able to ask for money for, um, you know, summer camps or supplies you need to run library demos. Organizations might be more likely to fund those types of things because they strengthen and build the community rather than just your team. Uh, and there can be some overlap there. So, you know, like I said, I keep using the example of tools for your team. A lot of times, um, you know, you might need hand tools, for example, and what you can do is build um, a structure around what you need that kind of supports the mission of the granting organization. So if they want to strengthen their community, you might be looking to run a summer camp for five sets of students. And so you might need to increase your hand tool set to have enough items for those five sets of students. And so that would be a win-win where you get the money you need to provide more hand tools for your team. But the grantor also gets a win because they're building the community and providing tools so that more people have the opportunity to participate. Um, and as far as uh, the actual like writing of the grant, you want to be, like I said before, as specific as possible. Um, you know, there needs to be no fluff. There needs to be no, so, you know, if you're writing a grant for a bus to, or, you know, if you're writing a grant for, let's say, motors for a drivetrain, you don't want to put in there about, you know, a paragraph about how you're going to take your robot and do a demo at the Museum of Science and Industry. That they don't, they might care, but not in this setting. They want to know specifically, we want these motors, they're going to cost this much. This is exactly what we're doing with them, and this is how it's going to benefit our team specifically. Um, the, more, the more narrow and specific you can be, the more likely you are to get that grant. And then how would you go about like finding that stuff about the grant you're applying for, like the people who are sponsoring that grant? Would it just be like a Google search going to their website or is there like a more specific way to find out? Um, I mean, there's a wide variety of ways you can find out. Uh, if it's a community organization, you might know somebody who's a part of that community organization. So you might know somebody, for example, who sits on the Chamber of Commerce or somebody on your team might. Um, you can also look at the vision and mission of the organization. A lot of times that information is found online. You can also look at the structure of the questions in the grant themselves. So if the questions are asking specifically, 
you know, we want to provide STEM skills, STEM skills to this specific group, or we want more women to be involved in STEM, or uh, any number of things in that range, you can kind of gear your answers to meet their mission as well. And a lot of times these grants, before you even apply for them, will have a page that's kind of about the grant and what they want to see in the submission. And you can make sure what you're writing, uh, writing it for aligns with those missions and ideas. So when you're applying for a grant, how much money do you think the team should be asking for? I mean, instead of asking for how much money, you need to more structure it as what do we need and put a price tag on that. Um, a lot of teams just kind of go for fundraising or go for writing grants and think we need money, period, the end. And so you kind of got to start big and narrow it down. So you might say we need money. OK, that's cool. What do you need your money for? Well, you know, we want to make our robot better. OK, cool. How can we help? Um, we want to use pneumatics. We've never used pneumatics on our robot before. OK, cool. How can we help? And so then you can kind of start big and go in and in and in, in all the way down to, you know, we want to create a test bed with this set of cylinders, this compressor, and we need this many feet of tubing so that we can build this in the off season and integrate those items into our robot in the coming year. And so then you can kind of put a price tag on that. Uh, and so, you know, that test bed of pneumatics might cost $1,000. And so you can put a price tag on that. Uh, and then, you know, opposite end, maybe your FTC team is traveling to world championships you've never been before. Uh, you can put a price tag on the bus it's going to cost to get there. You can put a price tag on the hotel rooms. And so for that instance, you might be asking for $5,000 because that would cover all of the hotel rooms and a $4,000 bus. Um, don't be afraid to ask for the money that you need to make specific things happen. And don't get quite so hung up on the dollar amount. So we've covered a lot of things about what to do. Do you have any advice that's like what not to do that if someone saw this on a grant application, they'd be like, absolutely not. We're not going to sponsor you. Um, so things to not to do are definitely don't write fluff. Um, you know, don't write a paragraph about how your robot makes people smile and you're going to win these awards. And I mean, basically, the people that read all these applications will read lots of them. And so you don't want to waste their time by filling it full of a bunch of things that don't really answer the question. Um, and then, like I said, just don't be super general. So don't say, you know, we want $1,000 for our team. Because that doesn't really tell them what, they're, what you're using it for or why you need it. Um, kind of dial it in and be as specific as possible. Uh, give them a list of what you want to buy and why you need it. Um, you'll be much more likely to receive those types of grants. Um, okay, so now a question from the Twitch stream. Uh, someone asked, what is the best approach for grants outside of your community? Um, Again, the same thing applies. Find out as much as you can about the organization and what the grant is specifically for. Uh, because again, so there's lots of grants out there. Don't be applying for a grant that's to put, you know, um, supplies in daycares if you're not a daycare looking to supply yourself. Um, as far as finding grants outside your community, um, things like Google are gonna be your best bet or the FIRST website has a wide variety of grants on their funding and fundraising pages. You should be able to find things outside of your community there. Uh, I personally have had the best luck with community organizations and receiving funds from them. So is there a difference for rookie teams or second year teams versus established teams when it comes to either writing a grant or their chances of getting a grant and what to include? Um, I don't think it really affects your chances of getting a grant unless, for example, it's a first grant specifically for rookie teams. Obviously, a veteran team's not going to get those. But the what you ask for is going to vary um, 
So rookie teams, it's pretty easy to think about, you know, oh, we're a brand new team. These are all of the things we might need to be successful. And so they might have more luck getting things like tools or new equipment or new supplies because they can use the, well, we're a first team. We don't have it yet, a first season, first year team. Um, older teams, a lot of times, may have to justify why they need things. So you might be, you know, asking for funding for a router for your shop, for example, and you might be able to list all of these reasons why it would make your life easier or how you might need it. And if you've been a longtime established team, an organization may say things like, well, you've never had it before. Why do you need it now? So if you're a more established team, be prepared to provide more of that why you know, structure it more like we want to get into more advanced manufacturing and this routing tool would allow us to apply the CAD we've been learning how to do. Whereas a first year team can kind of use the excuse of, you know, we're new and we need things to participate. Do you have any recommendations or tips on how either an FRC or an FTC can team can like report to whoever gave them a grant and just say this is how the grant impacted us do you have any advice on like reporting back and like thanking them um a lot of times grants will have very specific follow-up information that they need so you might have an organization that requires you to write thank you notes to specific people or to provide pictures or a year after the fact to do a write-up on how the money was specifically used so make sure when you're applying grants you understand what the follow-up procedures are um, but as far as just if there aren't any specific follow-up procedures, just include those grantors in your sponsorship. So whatever sponsorship level you would give somebody who pulled out their checkbook and wrote a $1,000 check for, do the same thing for the person who provided the grant or the organization um, if they want to be recognized in that fashion. Um, thank you notes go a long way as well and recognizing them in things like uh, teams often have end-of-year banquets sponsors and people who provide grants really like to be included in that information. Um, I personally think handwritten thank you notes go a long way, so don't be afraid to bust out the pen and paper or make some team numbers, provide that information. Um, how do you display confidence when asking for a grant to support something that you may not have started or might not have experience with before? Uh, can you repeat the question? Sorry, you cut out a little bit. Sorry. Um, how would you display confidence while asking for a grant to support something that you might not have had experience with before, something that you were maybe starting anew? Um, don't be afraid to admit it's something new for you. So, you know, a good example is there's lots of new motors that come out every year that you can use for both FRC and FTC. And if it's something you've never used before and you would like to, put that in the grant write-up. So for example, um, when the Neo motors were brand new and coming out, we wrote a grant to buy a full set of Neo motors and motor controllers so that we could do a test bed setup uh, in the summer before we actually competed. And we talked about how, you know, it was a brand new motor. We'd never had any experience with it before. And it was something we don't normally have access to. And so we would love to have access to this new unique thing. Um, and we were fully honest because we didn't really know much about them, but we wanted to learn. And that was the point of the grant. And it's okay to admit those things. Um, the flip side is, you know, if it's something you may not have experience with, but you want to sound like you know, so you, you know, you're writing a grant for a CAD computer and you don't know a lot about hardware, do your research before asking for money. So that way you can support it with, we need this processor, we need this graphics card so that we can have a proper workstation. So that you can at least sound like, and at that point, be an expert on what you're asking for, even if you don't know how to CAD yet. So for those of pe those people who are like new to writing grants, what's the large difference between specifically grants and a different form of sponsorship, such as like a recurring gift or just a one-time donation to the team? So grants are very specific things. Uh, they have a specific purpose and are for a specific amount of money, and you have to reapply to them every certain number of years. So, in you know, for, for for example, in large overseeing organizations at Purdue who provide grants for research, a lot of times the grants are dispersed over several several years, and so you might have one grant for three or four years, 
Uh, but generally, that's not how it works in FIRST. You have to reapply every single cycle. Um, so make sure when you're looking at the grants and you're applying for them that you understand what that cycle looks like. Um, and then generally with sponsorship, a lot of times you still have to ask for that money, but it's a little more informal. Um, you may be able to get fundraising without a specific earmark. So, you know, when you write money for a grant for motors, you have to use that money to buy motors. No ifs, ands, or buts. If you don't use that money for motors, they can take it back from you. Uh, with a sponsorship, you can kind of ask for more generic money. You can say, we need money for our team. You know, we use it to buy things like motors. But with, so every sponsorship is different. But with many of them, you know, if you don't spend it on exactly what you said you would dollar for dollar, it's generally more accepted as long as you keep the sponsor updated. Like, you know, we decided to go rogue this year and there's no motors on our robot. It's a walking pneumatic robot, you know, that generally as long as the money was still spent to better your team and your robot, the sponsor is okay with it. So do you think when you're applying for like a really similar grant, like a year after or so, either if you got the grant the first time or if you were denied the first time, is your chance of getting the grant still the same or does it decrease or increase if you've already applied for the same grant before? Um, it depends on the organization and that's not going to be something that I can give a specific answer on. Um, a lot of times if you're denied for a grant and you keep applying, make sure you're not putting the exact same in every same thing in every single time. Um, update it. You know, it's going to be kind of fishy if you're asking for this exact same set of motors every year for five years. That looks kind of sketchy. Um, but if it's a thing that you do use every year, so like batteries or something like that, it might be OK to write the same thing every year. Um, and then whether or not you get it every single year is also going to vary depending on the organization the grant is behind. So if you're applying, that's why some of those more community-based grants are better because they kind of can stay more up to date on you and what you're doing. Um, and so you might be the same amount of, you know, able to get that same grant every year. But also it kind of depends on how much money you're asking for. You know, if you've been asking for hand tools for several years, you're going to get to a point where they're like, you know, we've been giving you hand tools for a few years now. Where are they going? Are you eating them or what? Um, and so, you know, things like that, maybe you can't ask for every year, but I mean, your team is probably going to travel some year every year. So asking for money for buses isn't out of the question. But one thing that you'll notice on almost every single grant application is um, they want to know what other funding is being provided from by other sources. So if you have those things like buses every single year and you ask for them to pay for the buses every single year, you might get to a point where they're like, you know, you, you have this same cost every single year. Why aren't you finding more funding to support this cost? And so you might find more luck in asking for grants for specific new and unusual things. So a new large piece of equipment like a router or, you know, new motors that are new to first, not necessarily, you know, brand new for a season. Would you recommend if you have like a small business team, would you recommend focusing directly on grants versus sponsorships, doing like a split of the two? So which one is like more beneficial to the team? Um, Honestly, building and maintaining sponsor relationships is probably more beneficial to the team. Sponsors are going to be more likely to provide year after year after year, and that funding is kind of loosely, more loosely structured. So like I said earlier, you know, you can ask for money to sponsor your robot. They don't necessarily need to know exactly what you're spending it on. Um, but grants are kind of easier to utilize for those more interesting and unique things that come up as a team. You know, we've been running every single year. And then our CAD machine died, and now we need $1,500 to build a new CAD machine. That's kind of a new, unusual, unexpected expense that might be more applicable to writing a grant for. Or, you know, you might say our team is more interested in advanced manufacturing, and so we would like to purchase a router, and you can write a grant for specifically a router. Or, um, you know, if FTC came out tomorrow with a new kit, um, you know, from Actobotics, and you wanted to purchase it to move forward, like, you could still use your old kit from wherever, and that would be fine. But now it's a new expense that you have 
it's kind of something you'd like to try out and have for the future. And when you're going to submit your grants, would you recommend getting a blanket statement and submitting it for multiple grants? Or would you say, write something unique per group? Or would you just say, only go for a few each year or each cycle? Um, definitely don't write one blanket thing and submit it to lots of grants because a lot of times grants have really specific requirements. And so, you know, if you're writing, you know, if you're getting a grant from a community organization that's not really structured, then that, you know, blanket statement might work. But if you're writing to an organization that's interested in involving women for STEM and you're writing about how you need wrenches, that, that might not just slot in there very well. Um, so definitely take your time if you have the resources and write specific write-ups that are going to be wildly different for each grant. If you're looking more at, at only having the time to kind of write blanket statements, uh, that's probably a more of a something you'd want to send out to sponsors. But definitely grants a lot of times are, like I said, cyclic. They're kind of unique in that you don't just have to only get them right before your season. So you could spend your time in the summer writing them when you have a little more freedom. You're not trying to build a robot uh, or in the fall when you're trying to bring new students in and get them kind of used to how the team runs. Um, you know, researching those items might be a good task for new students. Um, so what should be the limit to the maximum effort given for a grant? So like if the grant continues to fail, um, like how many times would you go for it? And also how can that be applied for providing information back to the grant writer for other grants? Um, I mean, that's kind of hard to tell. So generally, um, I, I would try for a grant as many times as you feel comfortable. Like if you just keep trying and trying and trying and not getting it every, you know, every time for a couple years and they don't tell you why, it might be worthwhile to switch gears and try for a different grant or, um, you know, wait a few years. If they do tell you why or you have the ability to ask them why, make sure to make those changes. So, you know, if you reach out to them and they say they're looking for this specific thing uh, in the future, can you still hear me? Okay, I got a notice on my screen that said you couldn't hear me. Uh, so you might try to make those adjustments so that you can make your grant application stronger in the future. But um, if you're just not what they're looking for, it might be worthwhile to wait out a couple cycles. And you can always research what a lot of times they will publish what organizations received grant money and for what. And so then you can realign what you're asking for to kind of meet what they are interested in funding. Is it usual for a business or a company that is writing out or accepting grants to give, is it usual for them to respond if you get denied with why, or is it just something that some people do, some people don't? Um, some people do, some people don't. It kind of depends on your relationship with the organization that's providing the grant. Some of those like bigger, large scale grants will just say, you know, they'll send generic emails that say, we had a lot of applications this year and we were able to sponsor 15. Unfortunately, you were not one of them. And then you have, you know, there, there's nothing other than to try again next year because you don't know why. Uh, but some organizations will reach out to you and or in their response will say, you know, we funded this variety of um, this variety of projects this year. Please apply again in the future. Um, and also, if you have that kind of personal relationship with the organization with the grant, so, you know, community foundations, for example, uh, a lot of times, since, you know, you've been inviting those people to your shop or you've been having them at your banquet, then you kind of have that relationship built up and you can ask them, hey, you know, why didn't we get funded this year? Can we re reapply again in the future? And they might be able to tell you, well, we went for this specific type of project this year or, you know, we didn't have as much money in our budget this year as we expected to try again next year. Because sometimes it's not you, it's, it's them. All right, I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for coming on despite some webcam malfunctions. So thank they you so much for your contribution today. 
Have a yeah. good rest of your day. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, and uh, Betsy and Lucy, uh, Angela, thank you for uh, running the questions and, and pulling them off. Uh, it was a, a very informative session. Grant writing can be a really great tool for our teams uh, and some good info there. And I know that um, typically either Purdue forums and our IU forums, there have been some uh, fundraising sessions that have focused on grant writing. So teams in the future, uh, as we... Uh, <laughs> get back to some of those uh, types of events down in the future and you want to learn more, uh, definitely check it out. But uh, uh, as Betsy said, the First Inspires website also does have some uh, grant writing tips and uh, your community foundations uh, uh, typically might also run classes on those types of things too. So mm -hmm. yeah, well, very good. We're going to transition now into our next conversation. Uh, I know I think um, a couple of you are staying on and then we're having a few others join us. So if uh, those who are joining us want to go ahead and uh, turn on their cameras and their uh, and their microphones uh, and join us, we're going to uh, this year. We were very excited uh, to we being first Indiana Robotics. We were very excited to become the first Lego League Junior partner. Uh, this this year for us really has been about uh, learning. Uh, how to kind of manage the the um, expo events and kind of run from the administrative end. But what we thought we'd do is, is do a session here this evening uh, and bring some people in who've been mentoring uh, some FL junior teams uh, to share with our uh, our community, FRC, FTC, FLL, uh, uh, kind of the experience of mentoring First Lake League Junior, uh, how teams have done it or individuals, et cetera. So we really have kind of a, a nice um, uh, bit of experience here. Uh, so what I'll do real quick is maybe just have you kind of introduce yourselves. Uh, we'll start with, um, we, we know we just talked to Lucy and Angelie, but why don't you just quickly introduce yourselves and then we'll move on to the others. So I'll start. Hi, I'm Lucy. I'm from FRC Team 461. And over the past year, I have mentored both of the FLL junior teams in my community. Hi, I'm Anjali. I'm also from FRC Team 461, and I've also been mentoring both of our FLL junior teams this year. Great. Okay. Uh, Brian, you, you've been around for more than a couple of years, I think. <laughs> Yes, so my name is Brian Baylor. I'm the executive director of the E3 Robotics Center up in Elkhart. Um, this is my 21st year, uh, part of first. So yeah, a little bit longer than a year or two. Um, and we've really been doing the first Lego League Junior program since uh, 2013 when we really started some of the expos. Okay, great. Uh, Claire? So I'm Claire, I'm from 1741, and I started two FLL, all -girl, FLL Junior All-Girls Robotics teams at the library for my Gold Award for Girl Scouts. Hi, my name, Hi, my name is Addie. I'm from FRC Team 6956, and I'm in turn one of three FLL Junior teams in Westfield, Indiana. Okay, well, so what I thought we would do is uh, just kind of a panel conversation, and I'm just going to kind of put some different questions out there from from a standpoint of just kind of the the whole of the you know season. Um, the nice thing about FLL Junior is that uh, there is no real uh, season, so you, you don't have to just do it in the fall or just the spring. Uh, we've we've got expos that take place uh, in different parts of the year. But um, but I think what we, since there is no season, what we do maybe is talk a little bit about uh, what is FLL Junior and, uh, and then how has your group um, utilized the tools that you get with the, with the registration and how have you worked with uh, your FLL Junior teams? Uh, there's also what, within the world of FLL Junior, there's also what's called a class pack and those are a little bit different. Um, I think tonight we're going to be talking kind of more about the tr traditional, what, what first calls the teams. Uh, class packs are where schools or groups can buy kind of larger sets. And then they internally uh, kind of do their own uh, expos of things. Um, uh, we're going to have a future conversation about, about some examples of that um, down the road. But 
uh, today we're going to kind of talk a little bit more about traditional teams. So uh, with that kind of the, um, the coaching experience from day one, uh, I guess maybe we'll just kind of go around and, you know, you get your team formed, you register, uh, you do all those things on the first website, you pay for it, you get your stuff. Where do you start with an FLL junior team? Uh, uh, Brian, maybe you can kind of start us off and then we'll just kind of go around. Where do you start when you get a group of four or five kids together and you've got this box of Legos? Sure. So the first thing we, we definitely want to do is, you know, you want to make sure that your students understand that it, they're, they're meeting and kind of the, the schedule that you have set out for them. So really kind of picking that day and that time that works with all of your team. Uh, and sometimes that dictates who's going to be on what team. Um, I know several of the other panelists kind of talked about, you know, that they mentor multiple teams and that that can be, you can have like a Monday night team and you can have a Tuesday night team and they can kind of come in. And then that next component is once you have those teams established, we really look at, okay, who's going to be coaching and mentoring those students uh, and making sure that they are comfortable with the material. Um, if they've ever gone through any type of like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, VBS, um, Sunday school, uh, taught any type of thing with a standard curriculum within a classroom setting or a summer camp or STEM camp, um, I tell them, you know, you can open up that administrator guide that you get and essentially everything's in there. That administrator guide is gold. Um, and the, the biggest hurdle that we usually find is just working with the Weedy 2.0 set um, and getting familiar with some of those technologies. Uh, and that's where we find that either former First Lego League junior participants or even other first students coming in to help mentor um, have that wonderful experience of being able to pick up that technology of utilizing the Weedy 2.0 quickly in order to implement that. So not only do we kind of give them a little rundown of here's the administrator guide, uh, but then we also look at giving those coaches and mentors a rundown of here's that we do 2.0 um, kit and curriculum and some troubleshooting tips to go through. Okay. Um, and, and I guess I should have probably also started by saying with the first Lego league junior um, it's recommended. Uh, they say it, it could be kindergarten through about fourth grade. Um, uh, maybe one of you, uh, you guys can talk a little bit about what age groups do you actually utilize? So just real quick, uh, Brian, what, what age groups have you run FL Junior with? We've gone K through four. Uh, we're more, we, we see a little bit more of an impact with uh, second through fourth grade. And we allow those first graders in uh, kind of by, by a trial basis into the program. Okay. Lucy and Anjali, uh, the, um, your teams, uh, FLL junior teams, were they specific age groups or did you just kind of have kids of all? They were more of just anyone who was in the community and wanted to get <clears throat> on. So we had some younger students whose older siblings were in robotics. And we also had students in like third grade who came and they just wanted to get like a touch for it before they moved to our team's FLL programs. Okay. So, so you use it a little bit as a bridge into FLO. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Claire, what age groups uh, were the kids that you worked with at the library? They were like second and third grade. Okay. Now, did you do that on purpose or was that just who signed up to be a part of it? Yeah. So that was on purpose because like, that's the group that they like understand what's happening and it's not just let's play with Legos, but then they're not old enough that it bores really easily. Okay. So you, you wanted to focus a little bit more on the second and third graders. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then you had uh, two teams there. And then Addie, what about the Westfield? Um, we did K through fourth grade. Um, we didn't really separate our teams by age. Um, so, um, but most of our students were in the first grade. Okay. All right. Um, so kind of going back to the you got the kids, you got the stuff. And, and Brian had mentioned the, um, the administrator guide was a good tool and has been a good tool for them. Uh, what are some things that you do to kind of get the kids ready to start those initial builds? Did you do, did you have any kind of opening activities or things that you do to 
team build. Uh, Claire, were, did you do some stuff like that or? Yeah, so each meeting we started off with like a team activity. So like we do some type of like team bonding or like get to know you games just to kind of like break the tension at the beginning and get kids excited to actually start working. Okay. Uh, the, the rest of you uh, chime in, uh, some other kinds of activities you all did to? Um, we started um, some of our meetings with like a reading. So we'd bring in like um, like STEM based books, like the Ro uh, Rosie Revere like type books, um, basically to just get them ready and like to hone in their concentration. Okay. Yeah, we did a similar like open with a group activity and one, I remember earlier on in the season to make sure that they were comfortable in the environment that we were in, which was the public library, we would start off getting their energy out with like a little dance that they could just follow along with. And then we would lead into like just a group discussion about like what we were going to do, like utilize the whiteboard space that we had, and then we would get to building. Also, at the beginning of our like unofficial season, we had them all brainstorm what they would like to create with the Legos before they actually did it. So we had like this whiteboard area where we let them kind of draw out the different things that they wanted to build. And it was a lot of fun with them all kind of just running around with the markers and stuff. <laughs> yeah, and we've got some uh, pictures. Uh, Lucy sent me a few pictures and I'll, I'll put those over on the over the screen here in a minute. And then the other thing I was going to do is uh, also share on the screen. Uh, Brian had mentioned the uh, Lego we do. So just kind of briefly, I've got the Lego education site up to kind of show folks the um, the Lego we do kit. Uh, it, this is the core set. Uh, then with First Lego League Junior, that's kind of the set that you use every year. Uh, but then each year, uh, teams get an Inspire set, right? And this year, the uh, the Inspire set. Was the uh, the crane this year's theme? Boomtown build is kind of a, a part of the first rise, uh, city of the future, uh, kind of activity. Um, and again, the, then this year, uh, students followed uh, two characters throughout uh, May and Marco. Uh, and Marco's in a wheelchair, and so it's sort of about equity. Um, did you find that the students this year did they uh, enjoy the storyline, uh, following along with that? From my perspective, I would say yes, uh, because when we introduce the two characters, we also introduce them in Lego form. So we, we would talk about them and we would have them. And so some of the stuff of building accessible buildings and entryways uh, for Marco, you know, they had Marco in his wheelchair and they actually got to, you know, have something physically tangible that then they could uh, apply to what they were learning and, and building with. So that kind of kept through the whole entire thing of them um, wanting to kind of continue down that path and learn more about these two characters and how they could help them. Okay. And I know that that was a new feature this year with NFLL Junior was having kind of a storyline uh, to follow along. So uh, any, any other just kind of quick comments on that from the others that did your students enjoy following along with May and Marco. Did you guys focus on that or did you focus on a different piece of the of the build? For our kids, I feel like it kind of varied. There were some kids that were very pretty invested in the story and then there were some other kids who wanted to make their own like spaceships on Mars and stuff like that. And so I think we continued the story for the kids who were engaged with it, but then left the kids who didn't really want to do it and kind of just let them create their own thing. Okay. Well, good. Um, and going back to the we do now, uh, where and when do you introduce that? Um, and uh, how did you kind of manage the, the, the fact that you have one motor and uh, pretty much then one tablet uh, within a team of four or five, how did you manage that within your meetings? Uh, was it just once, did you take turns? Did you, was there, a, did you have like a student who kind of led that piece or did you have uh, kind of any thoughts there? We had a couple, 
Oh, sorry. I probably should point people out. So Addy, <laughs> you, you were about to say something good. Addy. Yeah. Sorry. So I was about to say that um, with our teams, we kind of use like the assembly line format where like they would like work as a group to do it, but each person would get a chance to like put their like piece into it so that everyone would have the experience of working together and completing the task. Angeli, you, you, I think you were about to say something. Sorry. Yeah, so we had a lot of um, student mentors that would kind of be with each of the groups so that we could facilitate like discussions between the kids about where they wanted their little cities to go. And honestly, we didn't, we didn't have a ton of conflicts between them. They actually really liked just being able to create their own things and stick it onto the city then afterwards. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, Claire, when did you start introducing the, um, the, did you start introducing the build part right away? Did you wait a while? Um, how soon did you start with having your, your students kind of, uh, at least begin to plan or think about based on the theme, what their build was going to be? Okay, so I found it really successful to slowly introduce new challenges to them. So they start off with the big overall project. And then as you keep going, be like, you guys ran into another like issue in your build and now you have to have this. And just like slowly like tack on more things so you don't just give it to them at once and they're really overwhelmed. I see, so within their build, you had them kind of solve one piece of it first and then yeah. say, oh, but now you, now you have to have electricity or now you have to have, and then they just solve one problem at a time instead of all the problems at once. Yeah. Okay. All right. Brian, what about you guys? Is it kind of unique to each team that you form? Because you you form quite a few teams. Yeah. So each year it varies. Uh, we've had as little as one team. We've had as many as I think like eight or nine. Um, and then working with so several of the schools as well to, to host their own teams. Um, and for some of our teams that we have, uh, our students have come in the, you know, the summer prior for us starting the fall season and have worked with the We Do 2.0. Um, so they're very familiar with it, of how it works um, and getting it to be able to use that motor. Uh, so we definitely utilize that aspect. Um, if we have brand new students that haven't touched the We Do 2.0, um, there's usually like a week in week like two or three. Uh, I think we've even done it as late, late as week four during the season where we introduce them and have them build Milo, which is the kind of small little cute looking robot with one eye and it, uh, you, you can drive Milo around. Um, and then as far as the actual build process for each season, we really kind of follow the, the engineering notebooks that the students get as they start to build up upon that. So a lot of that process then starts to happen week eight or nine where they're planning out kind of their full build of the 12 week session that we do with them. Um, and we utilize everything that they learned kind of week one to week like six or seven, then to implement that. And we, we make sure that we go back and try to pull something from each and every week that they can implement then um, from all the different students. Okay. Um, there's a, so we've got a couple of uh, Twitch questions um, that I'm gonna get to in a second. One I wanted to get to is, from a mentor perspective, uh, before we dive into some of these, uh, maybe just go, we'll go around the clock. We'll start with Lucy. Um, what are some things you did as a, as a mentor to kind of prepare yourself ahead of time? Um, you know, I'm thinking about my, my own days as a teacher, you want to try to stay a little bit ahead, uh, as, as ahead as you can of, of the students. What were some things you did to prep to mentor an FLL junior team? So for the prep, I mean, directly the day of, it was somewhat hard because it was directly after our school day, but Anjali and I, we were mentoring at the same time. So as we were like driving down to the library, we would talk about what challenges we might face that day and how we're going to overcome them. Like if we had a kid that might just, we are like a bit worried about them, but kind of address that problem beforehand and think about, okay, this is how we're gonna deal with it. But before I kind of looked back on my past experiences with FLL and how I was like, okay, I had like a mentor I didn't like, 
how can I change my behavior so that I don't have another kid feeling that way? And I just was like, I wanted to go in and I wanted to make sure that everyone felt like accepted. So I was always looking for like a kid who might just not be interacting well with others or who might be feeling left out. And that was just like my personal way is to just make sure that everyone was kind of getting their own attention. Okay, Anjali, we'll go to you since you guys worked together. So she took part of your answer. You guys talked in the car <laughs> on the way there. Were there some other things maybe you did uh, independently to kind of prep to become a mentor for this? Yeah, so honestly, um, being a mentor for the younger kids was a little bit new just because I don't really work with younger kids a lot. So something that I kind of thought about is, sorry, <laughs> I started kind of thinking about honestly kind of a similar thing of, but I wasn't in first before. So just activities that I did when I was younger that I thought were interesting or cool and kept me engaged. And also just um, being aware that kids are at different levels and knowing that before you go in was really helpful for me. And I'm really glad that I acknowledged that before going in because there are some kids that will be super engaged with the program and there'll be some kids who might not really wanna be there for the first couple of weeks. And just being patient with all of the kids and making sure that you're in a good mindset and like ready to deal with whatever <laughs> they throw at you before you go into the meeting is a really good thing to do. Okay. Addie, were there some things that you all did uh, um, besides yourself? Were there some other uh, Shamrock Botics students that helped? And what, did you guys do anything to kind of prep? Um, yeah, so there are three other students who like mentored full time with me and a few other students who would come in occasionally to help. Um, but before that, we had like uh, like a parent mentor meeting, like before, like we started meeting with the kids so that we could like know, like if a kid like likes learning a certain way or like allergies, because we also, also like uh, did snacks. Um, that was really helpful to know. But something else that we learned during was that, was how to learn, like, certain students learn certain ways and it's helpful to have those students together so that you don't leave students left behind as like other students are like pushing ahead. Um, you don't wanna leave anyone behind because that can create like a really bad experience for them. So that was also something that our team like acknowledged and started doing like pretty early in. Okay. Claire, how about you? How, how did you uh, prep for your your situation? So I'd start like before each meeting kind of thinking of like here's the meeting like agenda of what we plan on doing but I wouldn't make it like completely like sound so like you know there's a bit of leeway like making goals of this is what we should like have done by the end of this meeting like in relation to their building projects and then just kind of thinking of goals for like what you want each student to do so like some kids will be like really shy coming in so then you can be like I really hope that I can like break this kid out of the box a little bit and like get them to be a bit more social so like extra like working with those kids to get them to kind of get out of their comfort zone okay Brian uh with eight teams I'm sure you had some uh some help I hope running eight FL junior teams by yourself would seem like a very silly thing to do yeah. Um, but, um, but what, what are some things that you all do to kind of prep in general? Uh, just making sure that there's kind of a game plan going forward throughout the season. Uh, I kind of look at it as we, I, for myself personally, have a little, a little acronym called REDS, um, which is the, the four things I want to try to accomplish during each meeting. So during the meeting, we want to read something, uh, usually that's out of the engineering notebook. And then we want to have time to explore, whether that's with the WeDo 2.0 or just building Legos out of the box. Um, and then we want to document. So making sure that the kids are documenting something in their engineering notebook. Uh, so when we get to that point of later in the season, they remember they can kind of flip back through their engineering notebook and see, you know, things that they've drawn or written down, uh, because by the time you get you know, eight weeks out, they're not going to remember what happened in kind of the first couple of weeks. And then that final component is sharing uh, and being able to learn how to share with each other 
because there will be students that will only want to share their ideas, but not listen to the rest of the students. So having that ability to not only here's my idea, here's what I built, here's what I created, uh, or here's what I drew, but also be able to take a look at those others and have a discussion about, oh, I really like what you did with that in your build or that with your drawing. Um, it starts to build that foundation for the students as they move into things like First Lego League and First Tech Challenge. So that's kind of the, the things that we work on. And I say, okay, you know, make sure you're reading, exploring, documenting, and sharing during each meeting. I like that. Uh that acronym. So the, uh, a lot of really great ideas and, and a, quite a bit of prep, really, when you think about what you all are talking about. And, and what I really liked is the focus on the, on the kids. Uh, the one thing that I was, uh, that I didn't hear that I was wondering about too, that, that I'll ask, um, did you all get the stuff and, and play with it first? I mean, did you get the weedus out and did you like figure out how to play with it and build it? Did you try some of your own challenges? Did you get the inspire set out and build it and tear it down? Did you do some of that before you sat down with the kids? Claire, did you kind of get into the stuff and mess with it first or? Yeah. So since I did it at the library, we actually used all of the library's materials. So like I went into the library a couple of times beforehand and like, made sure all of the WeDo's were working and there were like plenty of Legos for everything. Okay. Yeah, I suppose, uh, I suppose especially after year one, um, you're gonna wanna make sure you've got uh, charging cords and batteries and things like that. I, I think about FLL days too, if you, if you were using batteries in the old uh, NXTs, uh, make sure, oh, have they been sitting in here for six months? Or, but did some of you other, like Addy, did your group get the stuff out and actually build with it and play with it yourselves beforehand? Um, yeah, a little bit, um, not really extensively, but I had, um, so I participated in IoT camp over the summer. And so I actually had the opportunity to actually um, do part of like the lesson plan with the WeDo's. So I already came into FLO Junior with um, quite a bit of knowledge. So that was also really helpful. Okay. Do you guys recommend, I mean, if, if adults are going to do this or high school students are going to do this, do you recommend get the, get the software out and actually build a program something with it if you've not done it before? Yeah. I, I'm seeing a lot of it. Yeah, Lucy, did, did, Lucy, did you do some of that beforehand? I personally did not beforehand, but I do remember after I think the first meeting we had um, I remember uh, the other mentors from 461 who were there, we kind of stayed after for a bit and just kind of messed around because that day they didn't get much to building, but afterwards we all just kind of got around and messed around and just interacted in that way. Okay. Brian, do you guys spend quite a bit of time at, at your facility beforehand with your adult mentors or, or high school mentors doing some of the do you, do you do any kind of guided training or anything like that for them? So we'll sit down with the coaches and mentors, uh, usually a couple of weeks beforehand and allow them to get the We Do 2.0 out uh, and build Milo and some other kind of creations uh, that they can kind of get their hands on to utilize that. I'll go through a couple of the lessons in the engineering notebook itself. Yeah, there's Milo on the screen. There's Milo. Yeah, I thought um, I you mentioned him a couple of times. Yeah. I thought, well, I better and, share that. And so the nice thing about Milo and that we also use this during our, our summer camps as well is there's kind of like four or five different ways that you can utilize Milo. Uh, and they start adding different types of sensors onto Milo. Uh, and then, you know, you start pairing multiple hubs. So it starts giving you a lot of the different options of what you're able to do very quickly with just one little build. Uh, which is nice to get that experience in a very short amount of time. Uh, and then if we do more in-depth personal development training for like our teachers, uh, we actually go a whole week and we do everything within the We Do 2.0 uh, software and curriculum. So they have that full experience of how they can take that and take First Lego League Junior and actually implement it into like a classroom setting uh, that they can then teach. Okay. Yeah, taking that step further. I think that's a an important thing, I think, from an adult standpoint, even a, even a high school young adult standpoint is to have some confidence with the technology uh, before you before you go in um, so that because uh, th I'm sure there are some cases where the students could probably leapfrog 
pretty quickly ahead of even your ability. But at the same time, you, you want to be able to be the wisdom on the side and, and be able to focus. So one of the questions we did get uh, on the um, Twitch was, how, how can you keep more advanced students uh, interested? Uh, in FLL Junior, especially when we start to get, I think that third to fourth grade level when it's like they're oh, they're probably ready for the EV three, but they're they they haven't aged out yet. Uh, any any tips there from have, have you seen that Brian? Since you've been around quite a while, um, a nice way of saying you're old. Um, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> that's okay. I'm a lot older than you. So. Uh, but how, how what have you guys done in terms of seeing the seeing that, and what do you so, do to keep kids interested? When, when we have students that are in that third and fourth grade area and they have some of those more advanced uh, kind of building and programming aspects, we really push the envelope a little bit for them even more. Um, and we initially are trying to group our students into like teams. So if there's you know a bunch of advanced students, we want to try to put them together so we can push them as a whole and they're not leaving kind of our our first graders in the dust over here that have just started the program. Um, and that that's kind of what works for us. And so some of the ways that we do that is adding more motors, requiring different sensor uses. So, you know, this year where they had to build the, the crane or the elevator, you know, can they build the elevator where it starts at the bottom and goes up to the top and stops using a sensor? Um, can you make it, you know, expand your elevator and have it go up two or three floors and stop at each floor? Um, and really kind of pushing the envelope there with how are they using sensors, how are they using motors. Um, if they get to the point where they're even beyond that, that's where you start to look at how can you incorporate an EV3 with a motor and a sensor to run different parts of their model uh, and start to slowly introduce some of those pro programming techniques in there. Um, and it's just kind of staging that because we will see some of our students still at trying to get one motor to function versus we have, you know, a group that's working with multiple motors, making things function and then sensors and then EV3 programming all kind of within the same uh, season for first leg of league junior. Okay. Um, a couple of the rest of you, did you have students uh, who were kind of pretty advanced that you saw come into your programs and to your teams that uh, did you have some, tricks or ways that you dealt with some more of the advanced students? Addie? Um, yeah. So since our teams were split by like personality types, um, like based on how we saw, um, I worked with a fourth grader among like first graders. And I could see that it was like starting to get like a little bit Frust more frustrating for him to like having to like slow down a bit. So what I started to do was I had him, I picked his brain a little bit more um, to like, just to keep him busy. Um, if he, uh, during our build times, I would ask questions about build. So I'd um, indulge him in that way. So that way he could get his expression out. I'm, I, I also have like um, all the teammates talk to each other so that, you know, not only is he, he growing, but he's also helping others grow as well. So I saw that that was a really great way to have everyone um, kind of like move at a similar pace. Oh, so I kind of build in some leadership opportunities. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I don't know the other ones, if you had any experience with that, um, with some advanced. Claire, did you have some issues with some kids who came in who were pretty advanced? Um. So throughout like as they keep doing kind of the same type of thing of like programming the robots they just kind of get tired of it so I would bring in like new things that they had to do like what would you have to do if like you had this problem instead and just kind of have them think about like just brainstorming things like not even building it and then I also would do some like science experiments with them or like different like coloring activities just to kind of give them a break from the actual programming so then they could kind of like let it simmer and then go back to it yeah okay um the a question from twitch was on forming teams uh do you assign teams right away or did you wait to did you try to try to figure out some of their personalities and make them fit a couple of you sort of hinted at it's kind of the way you you started to kind of organize teams um 
but um, maybe talk a little bit about that. Uh, Brian, what have you guys done a little bit? Do you, do you just bring all the kids in and you don't assign them right away or, or do you assign them right away? So we don't assign them right away. We definitely ask them kind of what days and times they're able to meet. Uh, usually we have, a, you know, anywhere from two to three days, depending on the, the amount of teams that we have. And then we say, okay, well, here's where everyone kind of wants to meet. And based on those students, we say, uh, we start to look at grade, um, prior involvement in first, and then we'll have kind of a parent student meeting uh, for everyone to kind of come in and we say hello and introduce all the coaches and mentors and get the students to kind of um, see how they're interacting with each other. So that way we can kind of group them into teams. And so we really try to focus on getting three to four kids on a team to, to solidify that. And you're a community-based program. So you might even get some kids who come in who might specify like a, a parent might come in and say, well, we want our daughter to be on the same team as, as her best friend over here. And so you yes. might get some of that. Okay. Yes. Um, so Lucy and Angeli, did you all do some stuff beforehand to kind of get to know each other? Or did you guys just split your teams up right away? And I'm going to show a couple of pictures while you're talking of your teams. Um, kind of what we did is when they would start brainstorming, um, during that there were a lot of ideas that would overlap or would make sense within like the same city of what they wanted to build. And so we kind of grouped them up that way so that like if one kid wanted to build a spaceship and the other kid wanted to build like a rocket or a planet or something like that, then it was really easy to group those kids together and they would have a similar idea for what they wanted to create. So like the picture on the screen right now, those are like the three things that those kids wanted to make when we were brainstorming them and the three things went together. So when they put it down, it was like their city, but they were each also able to individually create their own stuff. And that's how we made our teams. Okay. All right. And, um, a question, uh, do you provide opportunities for your junior teams uh, to go see other FIRST programs in action? So maybe uh, take a, an evening or a day or something, call out and see if there's an FLL or a FRC or FTC team in your area and go see them. Or maybe, maybe even if there's a competition, um, uh, do you do anything like that with your groups, Brian? So we have all four programs in the same space, uh, which is kind of a unique opportunity, uh, which allows our FRC and FR FTC students to come in and coach and mentor those students uh, during kind of the fall season for them. And then since they're only meeting an hour out of usually our three and a half hour time period that a lot of our other teams are utilizing, um, they'll meet. And then there's time for us to go and kind of visit with the FRC students and the FTC and even go and see what First Lego League is about. Um, and then we, a lot of them are siblings of our older students. So they're at our First Lego League qualifying tournaments and our FTC events and our FRC events. So there's definitely kind of that whole aspect. While they're, they're in-house, they're seeing what these other students are doing. They're seeing the robots and the work that they're they're working on and then they are attending our competitions to hopefully kind of continue that progression of programs as they go through okay claire did were you able to do anything i know i think you had a few other uh, frc students kind of help you during the season um during the year uh but were you able to get uh ex exposure for the girls in your program to some of the other programs yeah, so we talked to them quite a bit about different ways they can stay involved in robotics. So like we talked about, oh, when you get to middle school, you can join the teams that are at our middle schools and kind of getting them involved in our pipeline that we have throughout Center Grove. And we also talked about the upcoming competition that they could attend and like a couple of them were really interested. So we told their parents about it. Good. Uh, Addy, were you all able to uh, get your uh, your students out to see some other first related stuff? Um, yeah, so our FLO junior team um, meets a their meeting like kind of overlaps with our FRC meeting. 
And so a few of them have been able to like see like our team working in an action. Um, then we also invited that fellow junior team to our February showcase where we presented um, what our team has done in our robot. So they also got to see the robot up close and they got like a full in-depth explanation. Um, and we also invited them to our Bloomington event. Um, so a few of them showed up and got to see um, like us in action. Okay. And then I, um, Lucy and Angela, I think you had mentioned that some of the students in your fellow junior program were younger siblings. Um, and so are probably just like Brian and Zed are, are probably pretty aware of the program, but maybe some of the other community uh, kids that were on the team that maybe didn't have older siblings. Uh, were you able to get some exposure for them to other FIRST programs? So we had given them the option if they wanted to like come see our competitions, like we talked to their parents and everything, but it was, we offered them to go see our shop, but our, the space we were using for FL Junior was the public library and our shop was in a different building. So it was, it was pretty difficult to have a solid plan for that. But what we did have was a outreach demo thing at the library. I think it was during FL Junior season that we invited them to come see. We had two NXTs that were like playing soccer with each other. And then we had like an FTC sized robot that they could come and they could learn about the programs with the, our team, but they didn't like directly come to our competition or to our shop. Okay. Uh, the, another uh, question from Twitch was kind of about the, um, the management of the um, kind of behavior management piece was that if you don't have very many mentors around, or if maybe you have a small FRC team and you can only, you've only got maybe one or two people, um, what are some, um, uh, what are some practices that you all put in place for kind of the, the, the kids that maybe are causing a problem? And usually it usually maybe it's because it's, it, they're not as active as they'd like to be, or, or they might be frustrated. Uh, you know, they're not building what they want to be building. Um, were there some things that you all did to um, kind of deal with the, the behavior management piece? Claire, you were uh, you were in there kind of on your own quite a bit um, at the library. Uh, did you keep the parents around or did you engage the parents at all? Or what, what were you kind of doing in terms of from behavior management? Yeah, so the high school students were like the adults there, basically. So it was a little difficult getting them to actually listen because, you know, once we got to know them, they considered us like friends. So we would just take breaks and like if they started getting really loud, we'd just put on like a Just Dance video for them to like follow along with. Or, you know, sometimes they'd be like, let's do jumping jacks. And we're like, okay. <laughs> and just kind of getting them to wear out some of their energy because they did come directly after school. Oh yeah, they've been sitting in yeah. a classroom all day. And okay. Um, anyone else, Brian, was there, there some things that you all done or? I, I think one of the things we learned early on when we started coaching is uh, you don't want all the teams there all at the same time with a bunch of kids. And it's just like you as the sole mentor uh, or coach for, you know, that, you know, a, a large chunk uh, of teams. So definitely breaking it over several nights um, definitely helps with that. The other thing that we've done is, you know, we've coached teams as small as two students and as large as seven students before. Uh, and we found kind of that sweet spot for team management to try to keep everyone engaged, just three or four students on a team. Uh, so, you know, everyone's kind of getting active and participating. But if you get, you know, up to six students, you kind of have to then look at trying to subdivide the team itself. Um, we've never had issues where we've had to have parents stay for first Lego League Junior. Um, we've had instances in other programs in the past where we've asked um, parents to just Kind of stick around and, and see kind of what's going on with different behavioral issues um, and that's something on on our form that we ask when students actually register is there any type of uh, issues medical or behavioral that we need to know about uh, so if we have students that are on the autism scale which right now i think about 10 percent of our students um, in our programs are uh, on the autism spectrum in some way shape or form that we kind of know what 
what that is and are able to address that in the way that it needs to be properly. Um, and then the, the biggest thing that we've really learned to do is just kind of redirect some of the kids focus and energy of if they're really excited about something. Uh, and the, my best example that I have for this year is we had one kid that built Lego, what he called pizza cat. And all he wanted to do every meeting was talk about pizza cat and how amazing pizza cat was. So instead of just saying, no, you can't build pizza cat. We said, okay, let's talk about the adventures of pizza cat. And this week pizza cat is going to go here and do this. And he's going to go help Marcos and how can, uh, pizza cat help Marcos, uh, and getting him to, you know, go through that process of thinking about that as an adventure or, you know, a story definitely helped refocus some of that aspects of, well, I don't want to focus on the task today. I just want to play with this little pizza cat that I built. Uh, and it really kind of shifted him to build some of these incredible things and be part of the team and incorporate all of that. All right. Um, what about, uh, we have a question on Twitch. Uh, I keep looking over at our Twitch feed, sorry. I'm, I'm listening. Um, the weaving the core values uh, into what you all do. Um, were there uh, some things that you did purposely or or maybe not purposely? What what were some ways you kind of tried to weave some of the first core values into your first like league junior season? Hey, Addy? So something our team did for the first three or so meetings was um, we like actually read the first like core values like all together um, as like a team activity and it was pretty fun because um, like after that then we'd like talk about how we were going to like use it so for example like for innovate they or inclusion they talk about how they were going to like build something accessible so that people in wheelchairs can like enter their buildings and use like um, like their submarine ice cream maker. Um, so that was something that was really cool to see. Okay. Uh, Lucy, Angeli, did you all do anything kind of purposely like that or? So in the very beginning, we like talked about the values kind of like what Addie's done with their teams. And we took the values and we we're like, okay, here are the values. and later on in the season, we weren't explicitly saying, okay, let's focus on this one value. We kind of like looked at the kids as a mentor and we, all of us just kind of were like, okay, how can we include this in their day-to-day, -day, like what they're going to be doing on their team? And so if we had one student who was like totally focused on this one idea and was just kind of ignoring these other areas, we would go and we would talk to them and kind of like what Brian said earlier, about having them like tell a story with what they were doing rather than just doing that one specific thing. And then as a mentor, we would all try and include these other ideas in their story, but not explicitly saying, oh, do you remember this value? We would just kind of incorporate it into what we were doing. Wow. Uh, any other kind of thoughts on the including core values? I know we, we did the same thing that Addie did with her teams as we read through the core values, the first several meetings. Um, one of the other th great things that came out, I think it was on the um, first Lego League Junior share and learn group on Facebook is someone created like a six little panel um, core value poster that you can actually uh, download and print out. So that's what we've done is we've downloaded and printed that out and put it up. Um, in our space that we use for First Lego League Junior, as well as kind of all of our spaces. So it's, it's on the wall, um, always there, highlighting those six core values. Um, another question from, oh, uh, do you have a, before I move on to the other one, uh, do you have a favorite core value? We can just go around real quick and you can kind of think about it for a second. Discovery, innovation, impact, inclusion, <laughs> teamwork, and fun. <laughs> For me, it would be fun um, because if you're not having fun with First Lego League Junior, uh, I, I, 
to me, I'm like, okay, do you want to really mentor? Uh, a lot of our coaches and mentors actually end up sitting down with the kids and building along with them or building beside them or even their own little models because they're kind of Lego fans at heart too. And they're just like, oh, that's really cool. Can I build too? And it's like, yeah. So sometimes even some of the parents at the end of the meeting come in, they're sitting down at you know the little tiny tables next to the students building their own models. Okay. Lucy, do you have a favorite uh, core value? I have to agree with fun because especially being on like an FRC team so often we're always like, okay, this is what we need to do. We need to get straight to the point. And we kind of leave out this aspect of fun. And it's just something that when you grow older, it's kind of, you get tunnel vision and fun's just kind of left out. So having that being like a favorite thing and something to work towards because you're working with kids is just something that's really important to me. Okay. Anjali, so, so far we're two for fun. Um, I think I'd say my favorite both in FLL Junior and just in the first community in general would be inclusion. Um, just because honestly, that's what our team outreach focuses on. And it's a thing that I'm passionate about. So yeah. Okay. Addie, do you have a favorite core value? Um, I, this is so hard to choose. Um, but um, I guess I would really, I really like discovery because I'm like talking with the FLO junior kids and like explaining different ideas and seeing them like um, take that and apply it to like real life and then like apply that to their build has been something that has been um, very fun to see and um, they're like really amazing overall. Okay, Claire, favorite core value? I'm going to have to go with fun because I feel like all the other ones are kind of like left out if you don't have fun with it. Like, you know, you can work really hard and put so much effort into it, but it's not really anything unless you have fun with it. Like, especially in FRC, like you can put so much effort into the robot, but if you don't have fun with it, you don't really learn anything and you don't take anything away from it. Wow. Well, very good. Uh, fantastic answers. We have uh, uh, a question about kind of the the new norm, the the kind of whole staying home thing. Uh, if we continue to have stay home for, for the next FL junior season, um, do you have any plans for how you might keep it going? Is there a way that you might have a vision for keep it going from home? Any tips out there maybe for some, maybe some teams that are looking to register some teams for next year and all of a sudden they're like, whoa, well, if they can't come to the library, if they can't come to our facility, uh, have you kind of thought about that, Brian? Especially kind of running an organization that's kind of houses these teams. What have you been thinking? Yeah. About? So I guess connecting into the previous session about kind of writing grants, um, we've been actually uh, seeking out different grants and sponsors that are would help support kind of more of a virtual um, learning session. And the biggest hurdle that we found there is just making sure that the materials are available for the students. Um, that means getting access to more We Do 2.0 kits, to more tablets that we can kind of get out to students. So they have that um, ability to do the hands-on stuff with the, the robotics component of it. Uh, for, for us, we, you know, the, the Lego pieces and parts are easy to kind of get and divvy up. You know, the harder part is gonna be kind of that mission model or getting everything together at the end um, of what we're looking at. But we definitely feel that if we're able to get kind of that support and sponsors and several of those grants, we will be able to do a lot of the training virtually and then have meetings with students with the teams virtually as well. Um, once they have those materials. All right. Any of you, rest of you have any thoughts about it? I, it is a, it's a tough situation. I think the idea of some of the kind of the bulk Lego stuff at home, but even then some of the kids might not have that, but, but getting to them, but getting like the motors and sensors. And, and then especially as Brian mentioned, the inspire build set that separate, uh, in this case, this year, it was the crane and elevator, uh, you know, how can you do something like that? that but any thoughts, uh, Claire, could you have done yours remotely? <laughs> um, probably not. 
Um, like remotely things, I feel like it'd be easiest just to kind of send out little like STEM lessons to them if you have like a bunch of emails or even just sending it out to a district of like, here's fun science things you can do at home or like learn to be an engineer like by this. So then they have something they can look forward to coming back to once everything gets up and running again. Okay. Yeah, I think we're going to have to get creative uh, if if this kind of becomes a, a longer term norm for us. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. There was another uh, question. Uh, those of you who've been doing this as, uh, you know, you've got FRC teams that you're working with that then you're asking some of your FRC students or FTC uh, to go and, and maybe you've decided to create an FL junior team. Um, what are some things that you've done? Do you report back at all? Do you keep your FRC or FTC team updated on the on the progress of the FL junior team, do you get other students from your team to occasionally come out and be engaged or involved in this? Or is this just, we're doing it and the rest of the team might see them at an expo or, or what What have you all done? So Lucy and Angela, what have you done with, with 461? How do you kind of report back or keep the team informed? So what we kind of do, we kind of do a mixture of like talking back to our team but also talking just as the mentors. And one of the um, founders of the team is actually a 461 alum, Daphne Fauber. So we kind of talk as mentors after a meeting and just sum that up. But we will also go back to our team on like a different meeting and just be like, hey, like this is what happened. Like if we need advice from someone, we might talk to one of our head mentors just about like, hey, sometimes kids are like, different to work with as a teenager. Do you have advice? But we'll like go, we'll use our mentors as advice, but we'll also keep our team like caught up on this is what's happening on these different aspects of our community. Also with that, um, uh, all of our younger teams are open to mentoring with our FTC, um, FRC teams. So not only the FLL junior team, but also the FTC and FLL team. Um, any person from our FRC team can come and help mentor the students at any time. So it actually helps us a lot more because sometimes, um, so there is a steady, like, there's a cut, like a group of about five people who will be there all the time. But then there's also some people who might not be able to attend every meeting, but want to help out. And so they're always welcome to just come in and help out for a week or two. Okay. Addie, uh, what about, uh, Shamrock products? What do you guys do? Um, so we have our head mentor, Renee, who's like our bridge between the two groups. And um, since it's really hard to have a whole lot of students from the our, our FRC team mentor the FLO junior since they run about the same time. So um, basically what we do is um, at the end of our meetings, we have our wrap up where we talk about what we've done and what our plan is. And so in that way, we're able to get everyone caught up. Okay. Claire, did you have, you had some other help and, and yours was a little bit different because you were doing this as a specific project for your Girl Scout Gold Award. Uh, yeah. So the whole team did know about it and like, occasionally we talked to like media about it and we're like, Hey, can you guys come in and take some pictures? Or like, we also talked a lot to the mentors about it, about like advice that like, you know, a certain kid was like, going crazy and we didn't know how to fix it. So then we'd go and like get advice and yeah. Okay. And Brian, with everybody kind of in the same building for you, um, probably a little bit easy for everybody to know what everybody's up to. Absolutely. Uh, so there were several times where we had FRC and FTC students that weren't initially mentoring or coaching teams and they would definitely wander into the the junior space to see kind of what's going on and even to sit down and build Legos once again um, next, next to the students. And then, you know, once the, the junior meeting ended, the several of the FTC and FRC students would actually take them around and show them their robots and talk to them about, you know, what they're working on. Um, so it was a very fluid kind of back and forth where the older students were actually um, going in and seeing what the younger students were doing and vice versa. Great. Well, um, yeah, we're about we're about wrapped. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your time today. Um, I I think some of you did fall expos, 
Um, Lucy, Anjali, were yours uh, in the fall? And then Addie, yours, yours was going to be at the Perry yeah. District event. Yeah. Um, which which didn't happen, but I'm sure there'll still be a chance to find uh, something for for them for that to happen for them. Uh, and then I guess maybe just uh, real quick, um, any just one piece of advice, like one thing, make sure you blank for any kind of FRC team out there that's thinking they want to do this or FTC or, or whoever. Lucy, Angeli, any kind of one, make sure you... I would just say, make sure you realize that there's still kids because a lot of times with FRC, you get so used to working with like all these other teenagers and you just got to realize like they're kids, people have like rough days and you can't just force them to go build all this stuff with Lego. Sometimes you gotta, you gotta be flexible. You gotta work with them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of going off of that, make sure you have some patience with them. <laughs> they're, they're, yeah, they're young. They're doing their best. They're having some fun, but sometimes they just might not want to do it for that day, and that's okay. Yeah, and it's non-competitive, right? FLL Junior is an expo. It's not a, a competition. Addy, one one kind of one thing you can think of. Make sure you charge your iPads. <laughs> 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 Our team had like a little trouble with it, but um, yeah, make sure you charge your iPads. Make sure, you, okay. Claire, any one last piece of wisdom? Make sure you. Um, I'd more say like make sure you know that you're not like their teacher and you're there to support them and like help them have fun and you're not just like bossing them around and you're like, you're building this. Like it's all about them having fun and them learning. And if they don't want to do it like by the guide, like that's okay and you need to have some flexibility with it. A little coloring outside the lines is okay. Brian, one last thing, one, make sure you. Uh, for me, it's just having something where you can store all the stuff. Uh, yeah. You start to collect a lot of things. And so some type of tote or whatever, you can store a bunch of stuff. Uh, and then I guess the, the other part of that is uh, extra, the more extra Legos that you have uh, tends to decrease kind of the fighting and the, some of the arguing that you might get on the team. So extra Legos can save the day. Okay, well, good. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna transition to our next piece, which is uh, kind of a QA. and a It's a uh, team traditions, uh, terrific and tacky with uh, Sam, one of our student board of directors. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for this really great conversation about FLL Junior. We're really excited to see its growth here in the state of Indiana and the new uh, program we're gonna hear in another session, uh, probably in a few weeks, a little bit more about the new FLL Junior Discovery uh, program, which is Duplo, and it's no programming, no motors. It's all cute, uh, and it's it's really cool. So we're going to learn a little bit more about that program later. But again, thank you all for joining me, and I'm going to bring Sam on. Sam, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Fantastic. Uh, thanks for coming on, and and so uh, I'm going to kind of let you take it away, but tell us. Uh, we're going to be talking about team traditions. Yeah. Yeah. So the past couple of weeks, I've, um, I've been going through and looking at um, what different teams have been doing to um, the past couple of years to like celebrate not only their team specifically, but first and first Indiana and all the awesome things that they've been doing. So. Okay. Well, why don't you take it away and I'll, uh, I'll watch the, uh, the Twitch uh, in case anybody else has got some extra traditions. Maybe they've, uh, that we miss out on or if they've got questions and uh, we'll go from there. All right, awesome. So I have a little bit of a presentation and then I'll open up the floor for questions. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. So. All right, so um, when I was looking at a different topic to talk about over the past couple of weeks, I realized that a big part of first that we all think about is the traditions. Those traditions are something, some of them are really cute and funny. Some of them are really meaningful to teams. And some of them are just little things that teams do for fun to celebrate first and what it is for. So I was looking back and looking at all the different traditions that 
first has. And those traditions came from so many different levels of first and what first is. So it's not just an individual team thing. It's a first Indiana thing. And then I went back even further and it's not just the first Indiana thing. It's a first thing. Traditions are everywhere and they're huge across first. The first platform in its entirety has so many traditions and so many different things that they celebrate and different ideas and um, ways to celebrate that STEM and engineering kind of platform. And so I was going through and I was like, what's the big deal about traditions? Why are they so important? And I was talking with one of our other SBOD members, Devin, about our different like first experiences and how we've experienced first over the years. And we kind of came to the consensus of the first traditions that we all have and those traditions that we hold so dearly and do year after year really, really, truly reflect the first core values. So that's kind of the direction that I wanted to take this presentation is how the traditions that we have impact the discovery, innovation, impact, inclusion, teamwork, and fun that FIRST always strives for. And so I went through all of the traditions that FIRST and FIN and the individual teams have and kind of looked at how they fit into these core values. And surprisingly enough, some of these traditions I saw fitting into every single one of these values. And it was just really interesting how FIRST, even though we see ourselves as like a robotics community, goes outside of just that and has all of these different ideas that can impact um, all of these different values that we teach our first students all the time. So one of those was the innovation. So 1741 had a super, super cool um, innovation that they had a couple years back with their robot battery pack. So I think when Chris talked to me about it, it was in 2011 that they didn't have something to secure their battery in place. And so they found a white and red polka dot um, ribbon in their spirit stuff and they used it to cover their battery pack and ever since then um, one of every year they've had a ribbon that covers their battery um, holder and in 2017 they moved to like a metal battery pack and this um, metal battery pack was anodized red and then painted with white dots so it's just a way where even on your robot even in construction the tradition still holds where that like battery pack that battery holder was like something that represented them and their spirit and the way that they all came together and even all the sub teams had like a part and it just was a super cool thing to see and they still do it today. So yeah, the impact, obviously this is a newer tradition, but um, the fin at shark, like the shark fin at different fin events, the, the rebranding that we've had of like First Indiana, they were talking about and they brought up the idea of Shark Fin and just spreading that idea of First Indiana throughout the community. And as you can see, there's Renee and she's talking to a little girl about um, robotics and all that cool stuff. So you can see how even just the branding of First Indiana at like an impact level, how those traditions can impact younger generations and impact students even further than just um, fin, at a, fin at Broad can impact even the youngest children which is super, super cool. And then you get more into like discovery, which obviously discovery is super huge. It talks about innovation. It talks about the different values that um, people possess when it comes to like gaining new ideas and gaining new information. So this is something that my team does. We do a shark tank activity every year in the fall, which is where we kind of mock like the shark tank show. And we go through and give a group different items and as you can see on the table I have like birthday hat, zip ties, pipe cleaners, sort of like just totally random things and they have to put together an invention and it's kind of like a, a way to like discover the different um, ideas that they have in their mind, the different ways they can take the objects that they have and how to present and how to get sponsorships and how to create that kind of entrepreneurship mindset and so this um, not only discovers like that in like that invention and innovation part but also that entrepreneurship and business and the aesthetic and all these different things and a lot of other teams do a lot of act off-season activities like this where they do these icebreakers I know a lot of FTC teams do like the um, presentations in the off-season that um, help bring their team together and help their team learn what aspects of the team that they really really appreciate and know that innovation and want to discover more about those parts of their team, which is super, super important to what FIRST is and discovering and learning new things. So then we have the inclusion. And I was looking back at the different things that I've learned at first, learned at first competitions from over the years. And I really started looking at the different round tables that we have. And that's kind of a tradition that we've um, brought up over the past couple of years where we have round tables at every single competition talking about first like a girl or the LGBTQ 
part of first and it's it's a super awesome tradition in the sense that we make sure first as an organization is super super awesome about making sure that we have these traditions and have these different events every single year that just on like honor and include everybody that they can as a part of the first community which is a super super great way to make sure that everybody feels involved in the first community and is a tradition that first makes sure that they publicize and um keeps in mind which is super awesome and to back off of the first like a girl we have the awesome tr friday event i know that um, Chris and Renee were wearing their tiaras last Friday, but this is a first wide event, which I think they do it in the FTC um, challenge and they use it to support women in STEM fields. So everybody on the Friday of that competition wears their tiara and they wear these, everybody wears these tiaras. They can make them out of like Andy Mark parts or they can be actual tiaras. They can just be random things that they put on their heads. And it's just support to support women in STEM fields. And on this tiara Friday, and you can look up pictures online where you just see everybody wearing tiaras and so many teams going out and supporting all these different awesome women in STEM. And this is a tradition that I think has been happening since around 2015. And it's just a really cool way for everybody to see the inclusion that STEM has given um, women. So teamwork is obviously a huge part of like individual team culture and how we include others in that process. So one really awesome tradition that I learned about earlier this week was 1741's Kit Kat tradition. This tradition was started when one of the members on 1741 ate a Kit Kat incorrectly. Yes, they bit straight into a Kit Kat, it's wrong. But they then, their alliance partners were really upset about it. So now at every competition, they bring Kit Kats for themselves and their alliance partners to share. And it's just a really awesome way. And I think it's a super great way, especially with the red and their team branding and stuff, just to show how 1741 is like there for their team and everybody on their team, but they're also there for their alliance members and to show that that sense of community and that sense of teamwork across the board. And I think that that is really, really awesome. So another awesome part of the competitions that I always see and I always go to and I always wonder about who's gonna do what and bring in the newest ideas are these team awards. So a lot of teams, I know 1024 does it, 1018 does it and 6956 do it where they 3D print or manufacture these little mini awards for people and they give them out to different teams depending on teamwork or like cooperation, spirit alliance partners, all these different cool and awesome things that they they give out and they to just to show how they value the other teams at the competition. Um, first is really a community that values the the difference, the different things that teams do for other teams. And I know when Devin and I were talking, one of the huge things that we talked about was how it doesn't feel like a competition when you're at a first competition. It feels like you're just hanging out with a huge family. And it's this is the team awards in one way that when I always personally went to competitions that I saw these teams doing it and was like, hey, like, that's really awesome. Like, these teams are out here. They're bringing these awards. They're showing how not only they think they're doing awesome, but everybody's doing awesome. And I think that that's something that not only does first really, truly value, but I think individual teams do an awesome job at showing how not only their skills are great and match with their values, but everybody as a team together puts these values forward, which is super. So then obviously the biggest part of traditions is the fun behind them. There's not much to say about tradition. They're at base level when I started this presentation, one of the main things that I was talking about was how fun and awesome traditions are. And there were tons and tons of different things that people do throughout the build season and during award season that are purely so that their teams can have fun and have a sense of enjoyment. And one of the main ones that I saw was 461's Happy Cat Poster, which you can see here. This is a poster that they cast down from year to year, from senior to senior. And it gives them a, um, it gives them like a sense of camaraderie and it just shows the, just the passage of like the different classes, which is obviously super cool. And to go back on that fun aspect a little bit more, there is a huge part of FIRST that is that competition, that hard work, that dedication, but there is also just that that fun we do first because we love robots and we do first because we love the community and we do first because we love the people and the fun that we have while doing it fun the fun factor of first is what i think truly makes first first because there's first is just such a just a fun community and traditions really really show that 
traditions are a small little quirk or a small little part that a team has that may not be your stereotypical, like here we're out, we're building a robot, putting together a business plan, chairman's entrepreneurship, all that awesome stuff. It's, hey, here's something that we can kick back and relax to, something that we can spend our time doing that's not necessarily the stressful, maybe robot building time. It's it's a time where you can talk about team bonding, a time where you can send, talk about a sense of like camaraderie between people, which is a super awesome and super, I think, individual way that first is from a lot of different organizations because we have this like fun aspect. So the other one of my favorite traditions that I learned about was FRC 1024 and their bonfire that they have. I, th I thought it was really cool when somebody said they have a bonfire on October 24th. And then when I looked at the calendar, I was like, wait, that's 1024, which is pretty cool. So every year on 1024, they burn the previous year's field elements and have like a huge celebration. As you can see in the pictures, there's like tons of people standing around talking to each other, learning from each other, doing all these different things um, with each other, just hanging out. And it's really awesome just to see that even in the off season, like October, you don't think main robot building time for FRC. That's like your downtime. That's like when you're learning. But even in the off season, how people just come together and can hang out and can talk robots and can be together is super, super cool because back, like at least for FRC, like back in October or when any off season is, you don't really see people hanging out like this. So to see that people have traditions even outside of like crunch robot time is, is something that I think really, I personally really value and I think is really, really awesome to see. So there are a couple other teams that have really cool traditions during build season. So there are a lot of different teams such as the Robo Blazers and 7477 during their build season where they spend their time watching um, different shows or listening to different music in order to like get their mind like a break and like relax and like settle, like get like a little bit of stress off of the robot side and bring a little bit of fun into the shop. So 7617 watches the Great British Bake Off during their meetings, which is really cool. And then 7477 has like musical like a music week if you watched the um get to know the 2020 fin board last friday um, troy on the board kept talking about this music week and how they have like t swift tuesdays and disney wednesdays and florida georgia line fridays and all these different days for different kinds of music which was really cool to see and it was, it was awesome to talk about how it may not be necessarily robot related in the time that you're building robots but there is something to take your mind off of and there is something that's fun while there's that stressfulness like in the shop or different things that um, people can focus on outside of this like robot especially during like crunch build season which is really really cool and then I learned a lot of awesome like food or like trip traditions that different teams had 3940 actually has some pretty epic food traditions um they build they buy shamrock shakes for the whole team as soon as shamrock shakes come out which is really really cool and then on national pancake day they make pancakes which Sounds awesome because that usually lands on around stop build day or when stop build day used to be for FRC, which is um, obviously like another one of those super robot like crunch times trying to get your last minute like changes in before you have to bag the robot. But it, the nice thing about these traditions and a lot of these traditions is they're time to de-stress, time for teams to take stuff off their minds so that um, they can take a minute and have that fun that like first values so much. So 6956 is another team that has a really cool food tradition. They buy dilly bars for their team um, during competitions, which is another um, thing that like, even though 6956 is one of those younger teams, just, and a lot of the teams are younger teams, they still have these traditions and still have a growing like sense of community, which I think is really, really um, valuable and something that even as like young teams traditions as you can see throughout this presentation, we've had a lot of young teams that have had already so much impact by the traditions and the things that they've done. And then I think the other one on this slide is the quadrangles. After every night of competition, they go to Walmart and just hang out at Walmart for like a half hour. So just little things that may not necessarily, like I said, be robot related, but they're little fun things that teams can do. So then going back to competition, I know this is a thing a lot of teams do, but I know 50 tens is like, super awesome. Um, I was talking to Bella and she sent me these pictures of them wearing their tiger onesies. And I know a lot of teams have team uniforms, but their name's Tiger Dynasty and have the super iconic like tiger uniform that their drive team wears always. Um, these drive team uniforms are, and those drive team like 
movements and like talking to the um, MC right before matches like those are just parts of like competition tradition and that's a huge part of what first is when you go to a competition as like a second third year member of your team you know like what to expect you know that like 50 times gonna wear their tiger onesies or that um, a certain team's gonna do a certain dance or something that's really really um, different that you don't see at any point in the year besides that competition and what's nice about that is even though you're at a competition at a place where like you're competing with other robots there is that sense of fun there is that sense of community that teams have with one another because of things like this like this tradition like these little fun things the spirit traditions and all those super cool things like that so to wrap up the presentation itself Traditions are everywhere, inspiring us in our first values every day. You, as like I said earlier, I went through all of these like core values and traditions that first has, and traditions impact all of them. It's not just a, it's not just like a one and done. It's not just traditions are fun. Traditions do everything for first teams, and they're a huge part of our culture. They're a huge part of what first stands for, and um, they can be like like said at the beginning, tacky or terrific. There are some that. Um, may seem a little silly but have huge impact on a team and their culture and it's it's something that I know that is a huge part of the first command first community and is like really valuable to so many team members which is awesome so yeah any questions I guess yeah we have a couple questions we have one uh twitch comment that uh from FLL uh team 100 team storm had mentioned one of their traditions was they would wear matching hats for their FLL presentations and robot runs that somehow highlighted or advertised uh, their innovative solution for that season so it was kind of in the spirit of the crazy hat tradition that you know kind of part of a lot of crazy hats in first and so they would kind of do a team hat uh, but then a question was um, specifically for you, Sam, is, have you seen yourself grow because of your team's shark tank tradition and, and how, how have you seen yourself grow because of that? Yeah. So that was a tradition that was actually started my freshman year. So I was in like the first round of students to kind of have that like idea. So as like a, as like a regular, like just like a new first year team member, you go into it as um as they like put you into a group with like five or six other students and you go into our shop and take all these items and put them together and it gets you really thinking outside of the box and I think that that's kind of the impact that it had on me was that it was kind of my first realization that this wasn't just like build a robot that does like pick something up or like a, like accomplishes like a simple task by doing a simple thing it kind of that outside of the box thinking that first has like all the time this was the first kind of activity that I had ever experienced where that that really had shown through where I didn't have like a direct answer I had to go around and use what I had and use the different people like the different sponsors that came around um, to talk to us and the different objects that they had and use those tools and those skills and what I had and take that and present that um, and how to present something that like an idea that you have and an idea that is more original than um, just more of a, like a cookie cutter kind of thing, which I, which was something I had never seen before and really, really valued. Did that help you when it came time for uh, talking to judges and uh, activities like that at competition? Yeah, so that's definitely an activity where it's, it was like one of those first kinds of like big presentations that I had like technical wise. So when it came time around for build season, I was in pits talking about different parts of the robot and those ideas for that especially this year, this past year, it was definitely a different um, experience being able to think outside the box. And that was really, really awesome practice for that. Okay. Uh, so from all the things that you did here this evening, the ones that you showed, uh, shared with us, was there one that really stuck out with you that you really liked uh, the most? There are a couple. Besides your, own, besides your own. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ooh, the bomb the 1024 bonfire I just think was really really clever and I really just I especially since that's in the middle of like the FRC off season which is you don't see very many like traditions in like mid off season so to see that I think was really interesting and just the way that it came about obviously is a little funny so that's cool too and I really like the 1741 Kit Kat tradition that's that's really cute and yeah that got very serious 
I can imagine. Yeah, when the student ate those incorrectly, and then and then uh, then there was a a team captain two years later that wrote an essay on uh, the importance of eating Kit Kats correctly uh, for. I mean, we're talking about you know the standards of civilization. Uh, you are to snap each one individually and eat them individually. That is the correct way of, of eating a Kit Kat. You do not bite into a Kit Kat. <laughs> no. Yeah, but you're right. It's it's that fun stuff uh, that that makes us want to keep coming back for more. Uh, and um, and the the different teams and their different traditions. Um, it's so exciting to to get into the pits or get to the competition to see. You know, uh, for me, you know, here in Indiana, a lot of people know Team 1018 and how spirited they are. And every year they've got some kind of new phrase or new spirit angle. So it's always, you know, what are they going to do next? Right. Uh, but, you know, it's always going to be something uh, fun and and different. So, well, uh, thank you so much for for this. That was a, it was a lot of fun. Uh, certainly something uh, teams that maybe the pe people that are watching. Still, please uh, consider, uh, you know, share, con continue to share some of your traditions on our our uh, Twitch feed. Uh, and we'd love to see some of those out on social media as well with our Tradition Tuesday hashtag uh, that our student board um, has been trying to, to promote uh, on social media, right? Yeah, that's awesome. That's where I got a lot of the traditions from, just reposting your pictures and seeing how all the different teams have have that different part of their culture that is kind of individual to them. So that's definitely how, where I got a lot of like those, that, those ideas from, which is super cool to see. All right. Well, great. Thanks a lot, Sam. We've got uh, one more session this evening that's going to start here in just a couple minutes. Uh, I did want to take a second while we've got just a kind of a couple minutes between sessions. Uh, I wanted to remind everyone that again, next Thursday, 6.30 to 8.30 is our virtual showcase. We're going to be uh, um, announcing quite a few of the FIRST Robotics Competition Awards. Uh, we're going to be going through really all four program levels, uh, introducing uh, a couple of our FLL junior teams that were, uh, that were uh, going to be heading to Detroit for the World Festival. Uh, we're going to be highlighting our FLL winners from uh, this year um, and uh, FTC. Uh, the different awards there, uh, and then, of course, our, our FRC awards. So it'll be a fantastic evening right here on our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash First Inspires. And then the kind of the last uh, ad I want to plug is the um, uh, National Advocacy Conference. Uh, again, I've, uh, I've mentioned this before, but they are going virtual this year. Uh, so it would have been this June in Washington, D.C., uh, but this year, um, it will be online, virtual, like so many other things. Uh, teams can, uh, teams and individuals, anyone, uh, can register for uh, the Virtual National Advocacy Conference on their website, firstnac.org. And there's going to be two half-day Saturday sessions, Saturday, June 13th, Saturday, June 20th. Both those days are from noon to 4 p.m. And really, this is going to be focused on, on Advocacy 101, uh, some of the basics. Uh, there's no cost to attend, but you do need to register. Uh, all are welcome. Uh, but they do like people to know that this is sort of aimed for FTC and FRC uh, audiences. Uh, but hopefully, we'll get a lot of uh, Indiana folks on to uh, get some uh, advocacy training information as we here uh, in Indiana try to start to work towards uh, some uh, some um, pieces with our own legislature or our own community uh, efforts to advocate to grow this program and, and get more access to more young people. Uh, so with that, two little advertisements there for you. I'm going to bring on uh, the host, uh, kind of the facilitator of our, our next conversation, uh, Tom Wexler, uh, Tom, there you go. And I think, uh, I think Renee, uh, is going to be a part of this conversation. Um, but, uh, Hi. yeah, good evening. Thank you so much, Tom, for agreeing to run this. Uh, I'm going to back out here in a second, but I thought we'd take a second to let everybody get their, uh, cameras and microphones on oh, some familiar faces. Um, we've got a number of, uh, familiar faces and a lot of really 
you know, great people um, that I've gotten to know over the course of my time yeah. uh, working with First and, and and thank you, First Indiana Robotics. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Renee, for for giving us the opportunity to do this. Um, I'm excited and scared, but it's it's going to be amazing. We're going to have a, a fantastic time over this next hour. Great. I'm going to duck out. You guys take over, and uh, we'll see you as we wrap up. Cool. So. Thank you, everybody uh, out there in the Twitch world who is joining us. Uh, my name is Tom Wexler. I use he, him pronouns. And it is my honor to be facilitating our roundtable uh, panel discussion uh, this evening. Uh, we are going to look at STEM through a rainbow lens, uh, looking at the LGBTQ plus experience within FIRST. Uh, our goal tonight is we want to let you all know what exactly does this mean? What is this experience? Uh, for many of you, you may have. You, this may be your first experience, really peeking behind the curtain, if you will, uh, seeing what it's like to be uh, a person that is part of our lovely community, uh, LGBTQ+, uh, within, not just FIRST, but within STEM as well. Uh, we have, as you see, some amazing, incredible participants uh, who are joining me tonight, uh, and I want to take a moment to introduce them. Uh, as you know, we've got uh, our friendly Renee Brett. Renee becker Blau, uh, rock star of First Indiana. So she helped facilitate this. So Renee, thank you for joining us. Thank you. We've got, um, I've got too many windows open to try and do this. Okay, so uh, just introducing quickly in alphabetical order uh, by first name, we've got Eamon Green. Eamon is uh, the strategist, co-leader, scouting leader, and mechanical sub-team member on FRC Team 5530 at Green Hill School in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He's currently a process engineer at Delta Gear of Livyona, Michigan, and going into his first year of pursuing a mechanical engineering degree at the University of Michigan. And I will also add uh, one of the uh, two members on this from the LGBTQ plus of first group. So Eamon, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Next, we have John Kentfield. Uh, John Kentfield, whose pronouns are he, him, and happens to have stolen my fashion sense for the evening. Um, John's an alum of FIRST Robotics Competition. He started his first career in 2000 in the FIRST LEGO League. Uh, he's co-founder and president of the Rainbow STEM Alliance and a head referee for FIRST LEGO League, FIRST Tech Challenge, and FIRST Robotics Competition in the state of Indiana. So John, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Next, we have Katie Johnson. Katie is a FIRST alumna who has been involved with FIRST for over a decade as a student and a volunteer for FIRST LEGO League, FIRST Tech Challenge, FIRST Robotics Competition, and FIRST Global. She is now a first year student at Harvey Mudd College in California, and she plans to major in computer science. Also, I'm going to add her team, uh, the Schrodinger's Hat in FTC, was one of the Inspire Award winners. So Katie, thank you so much for joining us. I'm excited to be here, thank you. Next, we have Rachel Baker. Rachel is currently working as a consultant uh, and a consulting analyst at Accenture in Chicago. In her spare time, she volunteers as an MC and game announcer for FRC, listens to too many podcasts, stays involved with local nonprofits and politics, and spends too much money on mochas. During this quarantine, she's been baking lots of bread and building her island on Animal Crossing, as have many of my friends. Rachel, welcome to the conversation. Thank you for joining us. Hey, everyone. Happy to be here. Next, we have Zach Bamford. Zach is the, next year will be the Outreach Coordinator for FRC Team 1111 from Edgewater, Maryland. Uh, he's also a member of the first EDNI Youth Advocacy Committee. Uh, that's for uh, EDNI, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Uh, and of course, a student ambassador for LGBTQ of First. Zach, welcome. Thank you for having me. Of course. Uh, and we also have Zeph Long. Zeph is a first alumnus from Mississippi, director for the Rainbow STEM Alliance, and currently works full-time as First AmeriCorps VISTA leader, where he serves in supporting First AmeriCorps VISTAs in expanding access to FIRST programs in underserved communities. Zeph, thank you for joining us. I'm happy to be here. Of course. And just briefly, myself, uh, I am a first alumnus as well. I started in 2000 on an FRC team. Since then, I have mentored First Tech Challenge, First Lego League teams. I also serve as an MC in First Robotics Competition and First Tech Challenge as well. Uh, and I, along with John, I'm one of the co-founders of the Rainbow STEM Alliance. Uh, and we'll get to some of that a little bit later, uh, what the Rainbow STEM Alliance is, why we're here, and part of the reason why we created it. But 
first, uh, I want to get right into it. Uh, my goal for this evening is we want to, uh, for those of you watching at home, we want you to be able to take away something from this discussion, uh, some positive action item to be able to uh, either better yourself, the community around you. We have an amazing first community. I am so happy to be a part of it. Uh, and we want to just help share a little bit more of our knowledge base through this discussion. So um, I'm going to start, Zach, I'm gonna put you on the spot since you're in my center square. Um, Zach, tell us a little bit about your experience in FIRST as an LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ plus student. I guess, first off, I keep using this acronym. What exactly does that mean? We kind of throw it a lot, around a lot and take it for granted. Uh, so LGBTQ plus is a representation of um, uh, lesbian, gay, bi, queer, and trans. So it's everybody on sort of the gender and spectrum, uh, gender and sexuality spectrum. And the plus is obviously there because there are so many words used to describe it that, you know, it would be very hard to fit them all into an acronym. Uh, so yeah, that's what LGBT plus is. So this is my fourth year and first. And I didn't really start understanding that I was an LGBT plus team member until um, sophomore year when I started to actually explore and decide what I wanted to do. But my team was uh, more than accepting in everything I tried to do. I, uh, all my teammates were very nice when I came out. I had a lot of people come up to me and, you know, say, oh yeah, here, you know, I'm, whatever and we all sort of like bonded together really nicely and I'm just grateful that I had such an accepting team environment that really helped me blossom and then you know I went up to my team I'm like I think we should start doing more for the LGBT plus community and they backed me with full force and I really couldn't have been prouder of everything that my team's done to help. That's awesome that, that's really fantastic. Um, Eamon what about yourself as so you you were our two current students, the rest of us, have, those are times long gone by. Uh, so Eamon, what's your current experience as an FRC student uh, overlapping with this LGBTQ spectrum? So I go to a fairly progressive school in like a college town. So I've always had a very welcoming experience in my community. And when it comes to my time at first, I've seen just as much, if not more support. But I think that that's more of a testament to first commitment to equality than just where I happen to be. You know, competitions bring people from all different backgrounds and areas, but almost every interaction I've had with anybody has always been pleasant. So I think like FIRST has really done a good job for that. It has, and, and I like that FIRST continues to realize that, hey, we've got some areas we need to improve on and we're, and we're working on that. Um, Rachel, I'm gonna bounce the next question over to you. Um, Part of this conversation, there, there's this implicit, um, there, there's this implicit acceptance that we've already come out to our uh, team members, to our community, um, and a lot. Some people may not know what that is. So, what is coming to you? What is what is coming out, and why is that significant? Yeah, so coming out just means that you're sharing with someone or with a group of people that you um, have a non-normative sexual or gender identity, right? So it means that you identify somewhere within the LGBTQ plus acronym or community. Um, and that is something that could be really fraught for a lot of queer people, especially when it's the first time that you're sharing with someone um, because you're not sure about how they're going to respond. You're not sure if they're going to be happy for you and excited that you decided to share that part of your life with them, or if they might be a little judgmental or disagree or wish that that wasn't the case. And that can be really painful and that can be hard for a relationship or a group dynamic, especially when you're on a team and when you have to go through a build season with someone, or <laughs> if you're a driver and you're not sure if your operator is gonna be cool, right? Um, so it can be really fraught the first time you do that, but it's also something that queer people have to do and think about and do a mental calculation of every single day, right? So every single relationship that you have, every uh, conversation that you have with a new person, every coworker, every teammate, every classmate, those are people who you're not sure how much you're comfortable sharing that part of yourself with them. And so 
Unfortunately, it's a burden that a lot of, of queer people have to constantly think about. Um, and it's something that is really serious. And it is unfortunately one of those things that only gets better with time and with the more that you understand about your own sense of identity and how that is independent from how people choose to react to your identity. Um, it can be really hard if you're worried about people who you love or respect or at the very least have to work with and interact with. It can be really hard when you're doing that calculation um, if you're not sure how they're going to respond. So to follow up with that, and, and John and Zeph, I'm gonna ask you to add into this too. Um, real Understanding where we are now, um, I think it's safe to say that I'm amongst the oldest of the panelists here, um, and that, that we have that life experience uh, behind us. What is something that you wish someone had told you when you were on a first team uh, or when you were in a high school that, that you now know? Uh, something that would, would have helped make your experience uh, a little smoother, a little better, a little possibly happier. So John, why don't you hop on first? Sure. Um, honestly, I I don't know if that would have existed in my period of time in high school. Um, growing up in the early 2000s, even in a more liberal area like Connecticut, it still wasn't as commonly accepted. Um, but the biggest thing that I tell people, uh, especially young LGBTQ plus youth, is it gets better. And it sounds super cliche and it's the common, oh, it gets better, blah, blah, blah. But it really does. Um, from a personal standpoint, I wasn't comfortable coming out until I was in my 30s in terms of broad, this is who I am. Uh, all my friends in college knew I didn't make it a secret. Um, but it was just one of those things where it is your own personal experience and so, yes, it does get better, but until you're comfortable with yourself, you may not ever feel comfortable enough talking to someone else about it. Um, but one of the things, especially in a position like mine, working for a company like Andy Mark and having the support of the First Community and the Rainbow STEM Alliance and seeing the student group that is the LGBTQ plus of first, it, it really hits home that our community exists, we are valid, and no matter what time you're ready to have your moment, it's your moment, and you need to be able to take ownership of that on your own. Awesome. Uh, Zeph, is there anything you can uh, add to that about your experience? Yeah, um, so I think that for me, um, as growing up in the first program, um, just having it talked about, I grew up in Mississippi, so I grew up in the deep south um, versus, I know a lot of people have said that they grew up in more liberal areas, um, and I grew up on a team that was definitely not accepting. Um, to be honest, a lot of my relationships with my um, former teammates after I came out um, dissolved, and that was just part of that, um, but I think that it was important for me to realize um, and part of why I did end up coming out was that um, even if your team is not accepting, there are other people out there that are accepting and are also going through the same things as you. Um, and it's really rough, but there are, will always be more people than just the people that you meet in high school and the people that you might be spending time with now. Yeah, I, I think for me, one of, I, I think I was one of those people too, like John that came out later in life. Um, and far past high school, past college. And part of that was it kind of cyclical and feeding back that it was seeing a lot of the current students either on my teams or, or that I interacted with at competitions that, that helped reaffirm for me that there, even when in my own microchasm, I may have felt unsure that there was this bigger, more accepting population. And it, it almost felt like there was this burden kind of relieved from me that I didn't have to keep this secret anymore, that I could be a little bit truer to myself. And uh, anyway, uh, Zeph, awesome, thank you. Uh, Katie, since we haven't, haven't uh, picked on you yet, um, as, as 
one of our, you're right on that cusp. You've now had a year out of, uh, out of first as a student, but also you've had almost a decade, I think, as a student mm -hmm. in first from first Lego League through uh, first tech challenge. Um, what do you, as a student, what is one of the things you wish you could have told uh, some of your coaches or mentors? So I'm in the somewhat unique pos position that for my FTC team, my coaches are my parents. So in terms of coming out to them, that in some respects made it easier because I didn't have to have a separate conversation with my coaches. It was just when I came out to my parents. And then when I joined my FRC team, I was already very publicly out at that point. So I had already had a lot of involvement with LGBT plus at first as a student. And that part of my identity was just very out in the open at that point. So I didn't really have to have that conversation of coming out to my coaches and mentors. But something that I would want to tell to really coaches, mentors, volunteers everywhere throughout FIRST is I'd want them to be aware of the resources available um, for everyone, but then think specifically for students. So LGBTQ plus of FIRST, the Rainbow STEM Alliance, all of these different organizations that give such community to students. Because I think that's, what's, that's what was so important for me was having that space and that community where I could be so authentically who I am and where I was around people um, who'd had similar experiences and could really share and relate to those identities. So I think sharing those resources with everyone else is something that I'd really want mentors to be aware of um, and providing those to students. Fantastic. Zach and Eamon, uh, what about yourselves? What are some things that you wish you could tell either your coaches or mentors or volunteers or just coaches and mentors in general? So in general, on my team, my coaches have been very involved and I just wish I could have told them like, you can take a break. It's okay. <laughs> like I know my, uh, one of our coaches, he spends like hours after out, hour, like hours after our meetings, like discussing strategy with students and stuff like that. And I've just been like, you can take a break. Like you can put some of this load on us. You can put some of the load on, cause like he had, we, we also have a couple other head mentors as well. And uh, I know, in a, for example, uh, for the past like four years, like we go through our school for our funding and stuff, but sometimes it's not as convenient to say, hey school, can you give me a check for $2,000 so I can grab some new motors or something. So like our coach will pick that up for like a few weeks and then the school will send him the money later. But I'm just like, it's okay, you can take a break. And it's, I really wish I could have told my, men, my uh, coaches that. Zach, what about for you? So I was really fortunate. Uh, my uh, team's mentors, all of them have done a really good job of being open. So to all the mentors out there, I'd say just make sure your students know that you've got uh, an open line of communication, that they that they can contact you and have like a one on one conversation to discuss. It definitely makes the coming out process a lot easier. If You can build a relationship and then make a plan of action to execute. That way, each step is planned and you can go through it in a very methodical way. I've been very lucky in that my mentors have always made it clear that we can contact them, so. Indeed. Uh, one other thing, uh, so I just want to say to all of our friends out there on Twitch, um, if you have a question that you want to ask our panelists, go ahead and write it in the chat. Um, Renee's helping out with that and we'll be able to see it and I'll bring it up to the panel. Uh, and there's a couple of these, uh, I've got a long list of, we could probably do this for three hours, but nobody wants to see that. Um, that we'll, we'll get to, we'll try and get to as many of the, the community questions as possible. Uh, I also want to, uh, so, so kind of on that, students, what are the things we ask, you know, that you could tell your mentors and coaches? Um, Rachel and John, uh, as the two of you have mentored teams, um, what are some of the things that you wish you could you could tell your students or students in general? Yeah, so I've mentored, I think, FLL, FTC, and FRC. I've spent the most time with um, mentoring FRC 461, West Side Boiler Invasion in Indiana. Um, and something that I think is really central to my mentoring approach is that not only are we talking about business plans or about the robot or about chairmans, but I'm also here for you to support you as a person, right? Um, you are not just a cog in the machine. You are not just a student. You are not just someone who is a vessel for us to win or to get blue ribbons, right? You are someone who I deeply care about you and your well-being and your health and who your your identity and growth as a person, right? Um, 
And so it's just as important for me that you're feeling comfortable and safe in whatever environment you're occupying, especially one that I as a mentor have power and influence on. If you are feeling unsafe on the team or if you have conflict with someone on the team because of your identity or anything, like I wanna know about it and I wanna figure it out and I wanna do whatever I can do to make sure that you are feeling um, like you have the opportunity to be the person that you are and express those parts of yourself in a community that is going to support you, right? And then even beyond that, those differences, right? Those identities, those things that make you feel a little uncomfortable or like you're different, those are things that bring the most value to the team. Those are the things that um, from like a design thinking standpoint, right? The people who bring different things to the table, like those are the things that create the best ideas and that um, make us all think about the problem or the thing in front of us in a better way. They make us better engineers. They make us better people. It makes us better everything, right? And so that thing that you're worried about, that identity, um, that's the thing that I value in you the most, not only as a contributor to the team, but also as a person. And I want to do everything I can in my power to make sure that I'm creating a space where you feel comfortable and safe to express yourself in whatever way that might be. John, you want to add anything to that? I mean, it's pretty hard to follow up with what Rachel just said. Um, but one of the other things, especially me as a volunteer and a mentor, is I want the students to realize that just because you've graduated doesn't mean I'm not still here for you. Um, and that's that's part of why we did the RSA. Um, one of the students that, while I wasn't technically his mentor, uh, one of my, my good friends now, Gus, uh, was a student. <laughs> I got a smile out of Rachel on that one. Uh, Rachel and Gus knew each other very well and are also very good friends. But he's, he's the reason that like the LGBTQ of first pins became a thing. Um, it was a conversation he and I had. But like I just saw him the other day, even though we're social distancing, because I still want to follow up with, with the students after they've graduated. I want to make sure that they're still doing okay, that college is hard. It's not an easy thing. And especially in our community, mental health issues are a very large problem. Um, and so I kind of just, I try and check in on, on students every once in a while and just say, hey, how you doing? How's school going? Like this time period really sucks that we're in right now, but how are you doing as a person? And, and so feel free to reach out to your mentors. Like we're here for you even after you graduate, so. Man, it just got really dusty here in Pennsylvania. I don't know what's going on. Uh, John, thank you. Uh, so I want to shift uh, a little bit. Uh, we to um, I know we talked about towards the beginning of the conversation. We mentioned you know this this concept of coming out. And Zeph, I, I wanted to ask you. And Rachel talked about what is this process of coming out. But Zeph. Um, for, from your perspective, why is this significant? What, this this act of coming out and announcing, hey, here's who I am. Why does this matter? Um, I think that's a good question. And I do think that, um, okay, so I'm a gay trans man. So I've had a little bit of a different experience coming out as trans versus coming out as gay. Um, I would say that um, coming out as trans was important because in order to, um, you know, change my name, get the pronouns used um, that are correct for me, that involved me coming out to people and telling people that um, that's something I do less now. Um, as I'm further along in transition, it's a little bit less important that people know that I'm trans most of the time. Um, and being gay and being openly gay, which is something that I choose to do frequently, um, is really important to me personally because I know that having someone that I could look at and say like that person is gay I know this person is gay um, or even a lesbian or trans or bisexual whatever um, like that would have been something that would have meant a lot to me as a child and so it's important for me now to live visibly uh, because I know that there are other uh, youth out there that don't have role models don't see role models um, and it's important for them to see people um, that are adults that are living their lives um, out and open and happy. 
So, Seth, I think you touched on something very important there. Um, so one of the things that has, has for a long time been lumped together, and even when we say LGBTQ+, and a lot of these acronyms, um, is the notion of sexual identity versus gender identity. And we do connect them um, in the sense that it's, there is a lot of overlap, uh, but they are two separate things. And I think it's important to recognize that. Um, and on that concept of gender identity, um, Zach, I'm gonna throw this to you. I, we've seen a lot more acceptance, or at least I know I'm trying to push that acceptance of introducing oneself using their pronouns. Um, so why, what's, what's that, in, how, what is that in, sorry, this is, this is why I type things out. I'm not that great with improv. Uh, Zach, what's the significance and the importance of focusing on pronouns? It's, it's just like a two, three letter word, right? Yeah, so it's really important uh, when humans, we meet, we say our names, uh, so that way we can reference each other, but pronouns are the exact same thing. Uh, they just take the place of the name. So it's really important to get somebody's pronouns correct. And if they don't, uh, they don't offer, it's nice to just ask sometimes, uh, just that way you don't get it wrong. But we use pronouns so often. And once you start to think about using pronouns, you realize that it's such a big deal. And using somebody's correct pronouns is really just a big source of validation. It shows that you respect who they are and that you actually care for how they feel as a person. Uh, there's, uh, there's been instances where I've been called the wrong pronouns and it feels bad. And I can only imagine uh, what transgender people will have to go through uh, just, to, just trying to get people to call them by the correct pronouns. It's really a tough thing and you can really make somebody's uh, life a lot easier and happier if you just make sure to do the simple act of making sure you know who's, uh, make sure that you know their pronouns. Yeah, I, I think you touched on something really important there, that, that sense of validation. Um, and it's, it's an, to me, I think it's an easy change to make. Um, I know it may be difficult for some people um, where, where somebody who may have come out as trans and, and shifting to being able to use different pronouns and names may be difficult, but it's worth it. It's, I think it's so highly important that we do it and it's a, it's a respect thing. Uh, Zeph, you wanted to add something into that too, I believe. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say that on the topic of asking for pronouns, um, I will say as a trans person, don't do that in public, um, especially if you think somebody is trans, um, it's not polite. Um, I would say the best way to do that is to normalize the fact that you're introducing your pronouns, even if you think that the pronouns you're using are obvious, um, that makes it a more comfortable place for other people to do that without feeling as if um, they have to tell everyone that they're trans because some people consider that personal information. Um, and I think, no, I think that's, that's excellent. I think that can be done sometimes as simple as just in first, we're lucky at most events, people have name badges and, and adding just a simple, well, if you need to look down to see somebody's name, then you can look down and see somebody's pronoun. And Renee, I know you've been doing some work with that um, over out in Indiana. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So a few years ago, um, we had a uh, absolutely amazing volunteer who was volunteering, um, but was improperly identified um, according to the wrong gender. And so um, it was challenging, I think, for uh, a few of the contacts to maybe remember, um, you know, where they've been directed. And so um, what was really interesting is, you know, I've always been a really strong supporter of um you know lgbtq you know rights and the community um as an ally um and what was really important to me is that um you know i, I was brought up to believe that everyone should just be loved and appreciated the way you that you are um and i i didn't realize that that was something that um needed to be expressed obviously um and so wearing pins and like these different pieces were ways to kind of show that you know you believe those things. And so what I found out 
that year, it didn't, I didn't find out right at the event that it happened. I was very disappointed that people didn't feel like they could come to me to talk to me about this issue. And so, um, but that situation is why uh, my family and I and some of our friends created the first set of pronoun ribbons. So the rainbow colored, um, you know, he, him, she, her, they, them, fill in my pronoun uh, ribbons were created from that piece. Um, and then the Rainbow STEM Alliance took on the project and were able to expand it. And so um, that was that kind of piece of it was incredibly important. And I didn't realize how critical it was until I had that situation. And so I just kind of wanted to share um, as an ally why that was important and how I saw that being important to the community, but then also how we were able to specifically create something that has done, I believe, a lot of good. And John, I think that it's even shifted and shaped um, into future ways as as well. And so if you wanted to maybe talk about some of the pins, that would be fantastic. But then Rachel, I, I have talked to you before about how to, um, you know, to continue to be a really supportive ally. And so for instance, like in, in email signatures, you can put pronouns. So after John talks about the pins, if you wanted to throw in some examples, I think that would be incredibly helpful. Yeah, so um, I was fortunate to get in on the early days with Renee about getting the pronoun ribbons made. Um, and they typically were reserves for the first championship events where everyone has a name badge. Um, and so everyone can just have a normalized little ribbon under their name, name badge that has their pronouns that they prefer to identify with. Um, and one of the things that the RSA has decided to do this year uh, with a grant that we got was to get pronoun pins made. Um, so if you look right here, this one is the she, her pin. Um, and so we just have a bunch of different pronoun pins that are going to be available in the, the coming years to make it a more normalized thing across all first events. So it's not going to just be dedicated to uh, the championship events anymore. And I'll kind of, in our mind, help to normalize just sharing your pronouns as you see fit, so. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, and then also like something that has been very cool for me as I have kind of gone into the corporate world um, and I'm lucky enough to work at a company that um, is very inclusive and accepting of people who have non-normative gender and sexual identities. Um, it's been really cool for me to see all the different ways that um, specifically cis people can normalize the practice of sharing your pronouns because kind of as we talked about earlier, um, it really helps for people who um, are not at any risk of being outed or um, at any other like risk in terms of like social stuff or whatever that um, we normalize sharing our pronouns and the names that we prefer to be referred by. Um, and so it's been very cool for me to figure out how to like put them in signatures for emails and such, put them in your Twitter bio, put them if you're going to an event or networking or whatever, basically anywhere where you share your name in a social situation, it's great to also include your pronouns. So if you're at a networking event and you have to write on a name tag your name, throw down she, her, hers, or they, them, theirs, or he, him, his, whatever. Um, it's really great for cis people to take that initiative. Not only does it normalize it for non-binary and trans people, um, but it also signals to other straight people and to other cis people um, that you are someone who is an ally to the queer community um, and that you are not going to accept any queer phobia, transphobia, homophobia, whatever. Um, so it's a really cool thing that the queer people in your life recognize. It's something that um, allies to the trans community. Um, it's a small thing that you can do that helps. Um, and just doing it in your email signature, wearing the amazing pins that RSA has put together, um, throwing it on your name tag at champs, putting it in your Twitter bio, doing it at introductions, putting it on name tags. They're small things, but it's really important. And it signals a lot of things to a lot of different people. It does. Uh, one of the exciting things I saw this season, uh, I was at the, a couple of events that I volunteered at for First Tech Challenge in Pennsylvania. Uh, one of the teams, uh, 7244 out of the box robotics, but it took this idea and ran with it. They said, you know what, we think this is important. So we're gonna make, uh, they took their little badge maker machine and they made a couple hundred uh, 
front end pins to for their team members and for everybody else. Uh, and I was talking with them and I remember one of the students, I asked him, well, why, why are you doing this? Being the positive, I'm going to feed you a question because I know it's going to be a wonderful answer. And his response was, because it's the right thing to do, because this is what we should be doing. Uh, I think a lot of times, uh, those of us that are adults, we see, we are the ones far slower to change than the students. They, they've already got this. They've mastered what they need to do. Um, and, and one other thing before we continue, Rachel, uh, that you mentioned, you talked about cisgender. Uh, I just want to say to everybody who may be out there on Twitch who's never heard that term is unsure. Um, as, as, as our language evolves and we want to make sure that we are being the most accurate and the most expressive as possible, uh, knowing that this we have this giant spectrum that is gender identity and sexual identity, um, how do you consider normal when there is no normal? Um, so the term cisgender uh, applies to people who may who uh, are born with a specific gender and continue to identify with that. So for example, I'm a cisgender male. I was uh, identified as male at birth and continue to do so. Uh, so for those of you who may have gone, I, what's this cis? Now you know. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna come to uh, continuing this, uh, kind of this notion of, of confirming one's identity. Um, and and we, we've talked about coming out and this importance of it. Um, the, um, Katie, and I'm gonna jump to you because you've, you've got that experience of where you're now a mentor a little bit as well to others. Um, and and uh, Rachel as well, I'm gonna ask you to address this. Um, as a mentor, how do you balance when a student may be out on a team and to friends, but not out to parents or family? I think the first thing that I would want to stress there is that the number one priority should be not accidentally outing the student. So that means not forcing them to come out before they're ready. Um, for a lot of people, coming out is a really, really big part of their life. Um, it can be like they can see it as a rite of pass it, passage or just this really important thing. It can also be a matter of personal safety for some people. And so I think the number one priority should just be pointing out that you want to always prioritize not accidentally outing that student. So if you aren't sure, keep that in mind. And then the other thing that I would say is, so if the student is out in some scenarios, but not others, just make sure that in those scenarios where they are out and they can fully express who they are, that you are fully supportive of them um, in those instances and affirming their identity and letting them be themselves and express themselves there. But then also that you are su supporting that student through whatever else they may be going through when they aren't able to be out. So like I said, not outing them, but still showing them that support and making sure that they do realize that they have the support behind them. Zeph, as your as your role is a Vista, and that you've had a lot of interaction with different teams, um, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, I would say I think Katie uh, covered it, um, but I think that again, the best way to really confirm like whether someone is out um, and who they're out to is just to talk to them. Um, asking questions um, is especially because it can be a matter of personal safety. Um, and that's not just, it, maybe not just if they are in a position where um, they may have unsupportive people in their life, but also if um, they have mental health issues, if they're outed, um, that can cause a lot of strain, um, especially because mental health issues are incredibly common among LGBTQ plus youth. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, it's, uh, so I work in education. Uh, I work for a school district outside of Philadelphia and I'm thankful that we are a very accepting school. Um, but as, as we're, as a district, as we research different policies and things to formalize our acceptance, uh, a lot of it I think comes back to this concept of consent and understanding what somebody is comfortable sharing. Uh, exactly as Katie and Zeph, as you mentioned, um, and I think that's a big part of it, is making sure that that dialogue can continue. Um, and, and of course, in a respectful way. Uh, I know for some mentors that say, oh my gosh, I need to know everything and 
I need to make sure that I'm okay here, but then I need to use this pronoun or this name when I'm talking with the parents. And I think, again, just keeping it as a communication um, is, is, and respecting the individual and what they want or what they feel comfortable with is very important. Um, so, uh, Eamon, I'm gonna, I, I wanna ask this next question to you um, that, Thankfully, as you said, you're, you're part of a very welcoming community uh, as part of your team. Um, but how do you, how does one address resistance or opposition to, to gender identity or sexual orientation within a team? Right. So in response to some sort of event or incident of resistance or opposition, I'd suggest like a couple of steps. Um, First, I say pull the people of involved aside privately sooner rather than later and remind them of first values on inclusion and equality. Um, no place is the place for that sort of thing, but first, definitely ain't the environment that tolerates it. Um, then I'd say follow up later with the team and don't mention the people involved by name, but just remind the team that that sort of that sort of aggression isn't really tolerated. Yeah, I, and I think one of, the, as you were answering that, one of the other things, uh, yeah, it goes back to the first core values and gracious professionalism. Um, but we also, uh, that first has this wonderful um, non-medical incident reporting system that is open for anything and everything. Um, that that is also a way that a student can anonymously report um, and say, hey, we've got something going on here. Um, and that goes to first headquarters and then they can go back down to the team and say, hey, how can we help? Because uh, every person I've, I've ex interacted with at first headquarters as well, it's not a don't do this again. It's the we want to make sure that every experience is positive for students. So um, I want to switch gears again. Um, it looks like we've got um, we've got a couple questions in from Twitch. So Zach, I'm going to throw this first one to you. Um, how can we spend? Uh, a lot of places are doing uh, roundtable events at um, at district events or regional events. Um, how can we spread better awareness through LGBTQ plus roundtables at first events? Uh, that's a very good question. So I've actually hosted one of these events. Uh, it was really good. We uh, invited everybody to come. It was a really enriching experience uh, hearing all the stories and asking all the questions about uh, the current state of LGBT plus acceptance. It's really nice because uh, people have a resource right there at the event that they're already at where they can go and they can hear actual stories and they can really make a face-to-face -face connection and start to really understand. And this, I think this is a really good medium to understand um, uh, to gain acceptance because you can ask questions and you can understand and you can have a safe environment to really express yourself. Well, what do you, what do you think are some good questions to ask at round tables? Um, well, one of the questions that I asked was like, how do you think we could improve LGBT plus acceptance in the, um, in the community? So this was at a First Chesapeake event. So I asked how can First Chesapeake uh, improve on how, and it was interesting hearing about uh, like the individual issues people have, and then you can take those and you could even possibly um, try to work with uh, whatever, uh, try to work on improving policies uh, based on response to the questions. So you can uh, ask a variety of questions. They get some really insightful feedback from people. It, it's, I know I, I was supposed to come out to Indiana and participate in one. So I'm a little sad that, that didn't get to happen this year, but um, well, next year, next year, I'll get to come out to the Indiana district, hopefully. Um, so that, talking about different resources and what are, what are some of the organizations that can help with, uh, Katie, I'm going to pose this next question to you. Uh, it's kind of a softball question. So what we, we hear a lot of, um, I, we've heard there's this organization it's called LGBTQ plus the first. Um, we've seen a lot of people with these cool little dozer rainbow flag fans. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that organization and also what does it mean to be a partner team from, from LGBTQ plus the first? 
for sure. So LGBTQ plus at first is a student run organization that was started back in 2016. Whoa, four years ago. Okay, at least. Um, and so it's an organization run basically by students for students, mentors, volunteers, anyone involved in first. And so the idea is that it is a community and a support system for LGBTQ plus, LGBTQ plus people and allies within first. So it is both an organization that provides resources um, as far as like informational uh, pamphlets, resources online. They also work with the Rainbow STEM Alliance, which I'm sure you and John can talk plenty about at some point. Um, and then there are also a really community focused aspect of it. So my personal favorite part of LGBTQ plus at first is the Discord server, which has Zach or Eamon can say how many people are on it now. It's a lot. It's a very, very active community that's a great support system for LGBTQ plus people within FIRST. So we are that's about what... to approach a thousand. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> yep, we are at, I think last time I checked, 989. <laughs> that is so exciting. So that's LGBTQ plus of FIRST. And then one of the aspects of LGBTQ plus of FIRST, obviously there are a lot of students and staff members who run it directly but there are also partner teams who are involved. Um, and that's something that I'm really passionate about because it's actually one part of the organization that I helped create when I, wanted, when I was an admin for it. Um, and so these are individual, individual FTC or FRC teams who have applied to work with LGBTQ plus the first in some capacity. So that can be just promoting the organization online and at events and just sharing the information that's out there. It can also be a whole lot more involvement. So running round tables like Zach had talked about, running uh, presentations at first champs, all of these different kind of bigger uh, effort undertakings that teams might take. Um, and so basically it's a way for teams to one, identify themselves as accepting and inclusive for all, and also to have this great impact on the first community at large. And then I'll also throw this to Zach and Eamon if they'd like to add anything because they are both current admins for the organization. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh. You can go <laughs> Sorry, first. Sorry, you can go. Oh, okay. Why don't you go ahead? Okay. Uh, so yeah, I uh, last year I was on a team FTC fifty one seventy eight. And I also helped our FRC team both become partner teams in the same year. And it was actually a really cool process because I worked with people on both teams and we were really able to show, um, highlight the different aspects of the team that can help. So the uh, actual round table that I held was a part of FTC 5178 and we held it at a qualifier and it was pretty easy. It was really fun. We were able to work with the event coordinators and they were actually pretty happy to have us there. And we were also planning on having a, a round table at a local FRC event. So if your team has the opportunity, this is definitely something for you to consider because uh, it's really great for your team. It unites everybody. It really highlights what your team has to offer uh, working together. It's, it's really, uh, Amos, is there anything you want to add? Well. Oh, yeah. So I was also going to add the uh, aspect of like the different tiers of staff as well. So like we talked about like partner teams and we also talked about like our admins. So we have the administrative team, which is like the main governing body. And then we also have the representative team, which helps out with certain things like the blog and certain online things as well. And then we have the uh, ambassador tier, which is just like we have a I don't know how many exactly, but we have a decent amount of ambassadors and basically they are the main representative body of our organization. So at competitions and events, they pass out those pins that we were talking about in the future with the pronoun pins as well. So basically they are the front face of our organization and they represent us at competitions around the world. And one of the things that I love about LGBTQ plus at first is it all student run. It's there, there is not a single um, adult person saying do this do that it's it is it was created by students it still is continued to be run by students um, and so tying into that is the rainbow stem alliance we were actually um, as as john mentioned uh one of the ideas that he and a couple students had come up with was let's let's have some kind of significance uh, this all student organization is great but you run into some weird issues of money and you know things that, that you do run into problems with as all student, all student org. Uh, and so that's how part of how the Rainbow STEM Alliance was founded, um, was a way to continue to make uh, the, the, the LGBTQ plus the first pin sustainable. Um, 
and we wanted to expand on that. Uh, so we, uh, so this is now our, this is the end of our second year. Um, we've been a nonprofit organization, um, and our the Rainbow STEM Alliance's mission is to, uh, is to help promote uh, LGBTQ plus students in all STEM organizations. So right now we're, since a lot of us, our background is within FIRST, that's where we've started, but our goal is eventually uh, to be able to expand to all sorts of STEM organizations. Uh, a couple of cool things that we've got um, going on uh, that as John mentioned, they, the pronoun pins we're taking on as well um, to be able, so that way you don't have one ribbon that's patched on. And something brand new that we just launched uh, about a week or so ago, we now have the scholarship that we are opening that is now available to students within FIRST. Uh, all that information is, of course, at our website, uh, therainbowstemalliance.org. Um, it's also as part of hashtag apply, apply, apply at firstinspires.org slash alumni. Alumni, I believe, yes. And the scholarships page there. Um, thanks, Michelle Long. And um, we... Um, also, we're going to uh, we'll put into the uh, into the Twitch chat uh, the information on the LGBTQ plus of first Discord server. So uh, anybody who's there is welcome to uh, join. May get them up to 10, uh, 1,000 members tonight. Uh, and it really is it's a it's an incredibly supportive environment. Um, having seen it firsthand, uh, and that's part of the reason why we're all here. Um, so I do want to. Uh, segue a little bit from that because we have these incredible organizations that can help. Um, Rachel, I, I want to pose this next question to you. Um, one of the things is how, how can we, uh, sorry, um, so what advice, uh, so we talked about some, sorry, like multiple things going on. Um, so how can, how can, um, people empower teammates to become their own educators? Ooh, good question. I actually just talked about this. Um, I think that one of the most powerful things that allies can do is to take the initiative to educate themselves on communities and identities that they are not a part of or that they don't have, right? And that goes for everyone, right? If you're white, you should be educating yourself on um, the experiences that people of color face. If you're able-bodied, you should be experiencing it yourself on the disabled experiences. Um, if you're a man, you should be learning about the experiences of people who aren't men, right? Um, and I think that that is a hugely important thing for allies to do, obviously that signals to those people who have marginalized identities in your life that you care about them and that you're not just using them as a human encyclopedia for things that you don't experience. Um, and I think that unfortunately as queer people or as members of the queer community, um, oftentimes we get asked a lot of questions about our experience or our identities. I personally, I'm on this call, I'm clearly very comfortable talking <laughs> about my own experience and my own identities, but um, not every queer person is, not every woman is, not every black person is, not every whatever, right? Um, and so I think that it's really great for those people who are comfortable talking about it. Like I love giving recommendations for queer media and content made for and by queer people, right? I love recommending queer people that straight people can follow on Instagram and Twitter or books that people can read, podcasts they can check out, TV shows, whatever, right? I think that um, it's great for queer people to recommend fun, enjoyable educational content that um, is really digestible for straight people um, and cisgender people to kind of um, dip their toe in a little bit and then they can go down Wikipedia rabbit holes or learn about theory or like <laughs> kind of do more like 201, like 301 stuff. But if their entry point is Queer Eye on Netflix, that's great. Like that's a great starting point that will then get them to start to ask questions and to start to engage and to start to empathize and really um, have stake in a community that they're trying to be an ally for. So I think that media recommendation is a great way to start giving people resources. If they ask you a question and then you can answer it and then you'll be like, and I have a great article. I'm going to text it to you right now. Or like, also like 
we're driving to a competition in 2021 when this is not happening with the quarantine and such, let's throw on an episode of this podcast I love that does a really good job of like talking about the Stonewall riots, like whatever, just exposing people in your life to fun educational things to kind of get a conversation started um, is really great and also shows allies that they can take the initiative themselves to educate themselves on identities that they don't possess. Yeah, I, I, as you were saying that, one of the things that came to mind for me was I had an experience uh, about a year or two ago as I was explaining uh, Rainbow STEM Alliance and LGBTQ plus at first to another volunteer. And they, they said something in response and I'm like, that's, that's not quite the, the, the most appropriate language to use, but it was a moment where they showed that even though they may not have the right language yet, that, hey, they want to make an effort and show some compassion. Uh, and I think that's a very, it, it, to me, that's one of the things I always keep coming back to is that uh, starting with a level of compassion, understanding, and openness. Um, that, you know, part of, so part of my, my own journey, uh, kind of as it has evolved through all of this, uh, was I came out as a, uh, as a bi, a bisexual person. Um, but the more that I've researched, uh, which, which usually means that it's, it's a binary, that rather than being heterosexual as a man only liking women, that you have this balance, or you, you can uh, go to, anyway, uh, the point is, now as I've, uh, as I've continued to learn and understand language, I, I keep asking myself, well, maybe uh, that I, I am rather, instead of just bi, maybe I'm pan because is by being in offensive to people who may not fit in that same gender binary? And is that also, but do I care about that personally? So I think that's even those of us who are part of the community, the more we learn, the more that it expands where our, our standpoint is. Uh, Renee is reminding me we are getting close to running out of time. Um, so uh, Zach, I know that you want to, uh, you want to tag on to that as well. Yeah, so I had a story uh, pretty similar to that. Uh, we were setting up for our round table this year. And one of my teammates comes up to me and is like, well, why are we having this? And at first I was taken aback, but I realized that he hadn't had a lot of exposure to the community. And I realized that he was just genuinely, um, genuinely confused. And I took the time to explain that this is, um, you know, a way to, uh, make a comfortable space for LGBTQ plus people in post robotics. And he seemed really receptive. He was just genuinely curious. Nobody had ever taken the time to explain. And I think that's something uh, to notice is that sometimes people, you know, you're the first entry point into the LGBTQ plus community. And sometimes you just need to take a little bit of time, have a face to face conversation. Zeph, do you want to, and you said you also want to add something to that as well? Yeah. Um, I was just going to say that as adults, I think it is very important not to hold um, the students on your team and the students in your life um, up as your dictionary. Um, and I know that that was touched upon already, but these are students, um, and this is something I hear especially from trans students because that is a community that I interact with a lot. Um, a lot of times people think that they only know one trans person. Um, that's probably not true. <laughs> Um, you probably know more trans people than you think, but a lot of us um, don't live our lives telling everyone that we are trans. Um, but a lot of those students are put in positions where they feel like they must be a model trans person. Um, and I think that it is very important as adults, um, whether you're in the community or not, to not hold children, whether they're trans, um, any kind of oppressed group that they are at as your dictionary. They are a child. They are not you can educate yourself. Um, it's fine to ask questions about their personal experiences and their personal preferences, but I am very passionate about making sure that the children are taken care of um, because it is something that um, particularly, again, trans youth, I think, feel a large pressure to be that model trans person, um, even for the adults in their life. Um, we've got time, I think, for about uh, probably two or more questions. Um, or less. Um, John, uh, I'm going to toss one question to you. Uh, 
how can we best encourage LGBTQ plus students uh, to balance their mental and physical health? That's a good question. Um, honestly, the, the biggest thing with mental, mental and physical health is making sure that you are doing positive things for yourself. Um, that may be taking a night off from robotics. I know when I was a student, I was the, the team president. I felt that I had to be at every single meeting. I wish I had listened more to the adults in my life at that point that no, it was okay for me to miss a meeting or two. Um, so definitely take time for yourself, uh, do things that you enjoy that aren't robots. Um, I know I live my life by the robotics calendar and so there's that, but at the same point, I mean, that's, that's just something that you need to, to figure out. And if it means finding a mental health professional for you to go visit, take the time, find that person. And it may not be the first one, it may not be the second one, but you will find someone that you are able to go and talk to. Awesome. Uh, we're almost out of time, so I do want to pose one last question to everybody. Uh, and this is hopefully something that all of our friends watching on Twitch can take away with. Um, so panelists, what is some way you have changed your behavior to be more inclusive of others? So for me, one of the big things that I've done is as I MC events, um, anytime I'm making a public address, I specifically do not use gendered pronouns. I will not use ladies and gentlemen any further. Um, my two favorites are, hey, robot fans or distinguished guests um, as a way, it still is a audio signal and it gets everybody's attention. Um, but it's not that gender binary. So it's, it's a subtle thing. Most people will never notice, but to the one or two people that do, I think it makes all the difference. So uh, going around, Rachel, what is uh, one way that you've changed behavior to be more inclusive of others? Um, I think this tags on to an answer I gave earlier about how people can be allies to the queer community. But um, as someone who has been extremely privileged in terms of a lot of my identities, being white, being cisgender, having access to education, being able-bodied, I think that I have just gone out of my way to do research on identities and on communities that I am not a part of. Um, and I think that it has not only made me a better ally to those communities, but it's also helped me to understand my own identities and how I kind of fit in in the world. So making sure I'm broadening my horizons in terms of who I follow on social media, what content I consume, how I empathize with people who have different experiences than me, um, that was huge for me. And it's not a small thing. I think that um, examining your privilege can be really uncomfortable and hard at times, but it is effort that I think is worth it. Zeph, what about you? Um, I was gonna say that, um, uh, like Rachel, um, I am a research person. I like to research, I like to read about things. Um, so doing research on experiences that are different from my own, um, has been a big part of educating myself on identities that um, I'm not a part of, as well as identities that I am, because there's always multiple perspectives within a community. Um, and um, in addition to that, I would just say that another thing that I've done is, yeah, examining your own privilege goes right along with that, um, which is, as Rachel said again, um, uncomfortable sometimes, but I think it's very important in making sure that um, you're really being as inclusive as possible. Amen. Yeah, so uh, one thing that I've learned, I know we, some people talk about like uh, using preferred pronouns and using preferred names, but also just respecting that those might change as people figure things out for themselves. Like, you know, like sometimes they'll see some pronoun as their own, but then later they'll figure out, okay, this actually works better for me. And just respecting that they might change their mind it's not that they're indecisive, that's just how they are moving along with the course of their identity. Katie, what about you? For me, something that I've worked on is not making assumptions. So not assuming that someone is cisgender and not assuming that they're heterosexual. I think that the culture that we live in really makes that the norm and it can be hard for anyone to unlearn that. But as you start working on that, it can really help to make um, you more inclusive of other, of other people and create a more inclusive environment. So not making assumptions. Wonderful. Zach? 
Oh, one thing that I've always had trouble with is um, like understanding the emotions of others. So just being able to interface with somebody and to feel and to like empathize with them and to try to truly understand what they're going through has been something that I've really had to work on. And I think it makes it easier to have one on one conversations because it flows nicely. Cool. John? Um, one of the big things for me, especially recently, is as someone who feels that they are an ally to uh, women, non-binary, transgender, African-American communities, basically all these marginalized groups, just because what you think you're doing is correct doesn't mean that that's how that community feels. And you need to be willing and open and accepting of someone in that community correcting you when you're wrong. Um, I have some absolutely amazing friends that call me out on it all the time because I think I'm doing a better job, but I'm not. And that's something that I need to work on myself, but something that I think everyone can kind of take on as a challenge for themselves to begin with is be accepting of people that are correcting you because they're the ones living that experience, not you. Oh, and finally, Renee. Sure. So um, as a leader in the, you know, Finn family community, um, one of the things that I started doing this year was, well, not even this year, actually, um, ever since I think maybe 2017, um, one, making sure that there is an opportunity to host an LGBTQ plus of first round table and sometimes making sure people are poked to remind them that they need to tell me when they need a room and telling them what time is available and things like that. Um, but I always make sure that those options are available at our events along with a uh, women are first in robotics round table um, event. And then I think one of the other big things that I'm able to do um, in my position now that I've been here for six years um, is I strategically um, invite people to volunteer. And so for the first time uh, since coming to Indiana and feeling like everything was really under control and I could actually like focus on um, ensuring we had have a diverse volunteer base um, instead of doing like a generic all call of like desperately, we need robot inspectors or things like that, you know, coming up to the events really close to them. Um, instead, there was more of a conscious effort to, to invite people to be involved. And one of the, um, the really interesting things in terms of just changing that mindset um, allowed us to kind of have very um, equal and a very diverse group of volunteers that were uh, going to be at all of our events before they were canceled. Um, and so that was something that I was really excited about. And so literally the, the process of making that invitation was a piece of it. Um, right, postponed, John, the events were, are, or are in a state of suspension, so. Um, with that, you know, Tom and everyone on the panel, I just want to say thank you so much for taking this time uh, to contribute this to the conference. Uh, we will be sharing this and posting this on YouTube, and you are welcome to share it with the community. Um, but I think that there was a lot here that was very valuable um, for everyone in FIM. And Tom, do you have any final parting remarks or comments about resources? Of course. Um, I mean, I could talk for another three hours, but. Um... First, I want to, of course, thank John, Rachel, Amon, Zach, Katie, Neff. Thank you for joining us. Um, thank you to First Indiana Robotics and Renee and Chris for hosting us. Uh, thank you to all of you on Twitch who are watching along live and to all the people who will be watching this in the future. Um, definitely check out um, First itself as an organization is doing a lot of work with equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, in uh, and expanding that and making sure that everybody is included. Um, so you can take a look, of course, at their resources at firstinspires.org. Um, you have ourselves, the Rainbow STEM Alliance. Our goal is to help support all the students, um, as well as our scholarship this year that we have for students and all the work we're doing with PINs and things behind the scenes. Um, you can visit us at therainbowstemalliance.org. Um, you can also, of course, our student group, uh, the LGBTQ plus of first student group, you can find them on Discord, um, LGBTQ plus of first.org. Um, we'll also take you to all of their resources. Uh, and of course, just thank you to all of you who are making an effort to continue to better the lives of others.
this is one of the things that I love about FIRST. I have loved about FIRST since eighth grade when I was at an FRC event, um, that it is so accepting and welcoming of everybody. You can be your true self at a competition, whatever your true self may be. Uh, and it's part of my job to help make sure that that continues and continues for the next generation. So thank you all for watching. Thank you all panelists for attending. Uh, and thank you again, Renee and Chris and First Indiana for hosting this. Uh, looking at all of you other districts, it's your turn to continue this and uh, help grow it out. So Renee, Chris, over to you. Thank you so much. Fantastic. All thank right, you, Chris, Tom. I think yeah. you've got a couple things to wrap us up with. And we have a lot of great sessions. We're coming up oh, tomorrow, too. We've got some fantastic uh, content tomorrow. Uh, we've got um, the uh, opening session is going to be an interview with uh, Heidi Frock from National Instruments. Uh, we've got uh, two sessions kind of back to back that are a little bit similar. We've got how do you become an MC or game announcer? uh in first and so we've got some of our fantastic uh mc game announcers uh out there that uh are going to be joining that conversation uh and then speaking of game announcer mcs uh we've got a conversation with nick hams uh global googler globe trotter that renee minnesotan minnesotan, minnesotan googler globe trotter minnesotan google yeah so that that'll be a fun uh it's always fun when nick is around so a great conversation with nick and then we're gonna uh have reinventing the perception of women uh in stem fields uh with uh, a couple of um uh, people from the reinventing uh magazine that's out renee um uh, any information there about that one Yes. Yeah, so uh, Reinvented Magazine uh, was created a few years ago to be um, essentially a magazine created by women in STEM for women in STEM. And so uh, it's a really fascinating uh, story of how they started up and what they where they've been around. And they are currently on their fourth issue um, or they just wrapped up their third. They're going on their fourth issue. Um, and so we'll have the women uh, who like founded it and then they'll talk about like what work goes into it. And they'll also talk about why it's an actual physical uh, magazine. And a lot of that has to do with equity and access to um, technology and making sure that like at any time anyone buys a magazine, they're making a donation in a one for one program to underserved uh, youth uh, in areas across the United States, which is really cool. So, well, yeah. it sounds fantastic. It sounds like uh, we've got a great lineup tomorrow and we would be remiss without mentioning that a week from tonight, as we've said several times today, is our virtual showcase, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. It's going to be all award show. It's going to be fantastic covering first Lego League Junior all the way to first robotics competition. Uh, we know we've had a, uh, as John told us, a postponed suspended into later season but we do have some awards to give out uh and uh, some teams and individuals to lift up and that's going to be a great night so make sure all of you it'll be right here twitch.tv first in robotics next thursday the 30th 6 30 to 8 30 p.m eastern time for the uh extra pockets of indiana that are on central time will be on eastern time so fantastic thank you so much uh and uh, thank you for all of our participants uh, tonight. Uh, this last conversation to wrap us up this evening was so moving uh, and so fantastic. So thank you uh, and have a great one.